Um, but we won't formally get started. But because um, I have so, you know, I know you run, you know, Healthy Surprise, Jumbo Superfoods, and also uh, the Dirt Paleo Personal Care. Um, but your Facebook uh, pictures hook, you know, suck me in. I did a lot of research for this. And so yeah. I have to ask about the, um, you're, you're, you're smiling already, the OM Practice Club. Yeah. Sure. Tell me about that. Well, what do you know about it? I, I don't know much at all. I just saw it in like a little a provocative picture. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to, you know, see what it is. And all I saw was, okay, it's a yoga class. And then I'm like, what's OM? And then I look what OM is and it says orgasmic meditation. So I'm like, all right, I have to ask them what this is. Well, this would be highly good for the show because um, people love risky sex stuff. But uh, <laughs> orgasmic meditation is a... It's a practice and like a branded thing that uh, I, for, I don't know the exact lady, but but some lady developed, and it basically they've they've taken this um, like this concept of sex and they've kind of put it into a box and made this very specific practice that they call oming orgasmic meditation. Okay, and they kind of have a not. I get. I like the pun. I gotcha. Yeah. Right, and they have a, a non-conventional definition of orgasm hmm. um, compared to what most people they would say that most people consider orgasm to be what we what, what they would refer to as climax which is kind of like the uh, uh but they look at it as like this whole bigger a bigger scope of it hmm. and <clears throat> they think that um well their their model of oming is where uh a woman lays down yeah. in a nest that is constructed by the by the man or Another woman. It's like a nest. What is the nest made up of? A nest mm-hmm. is uh, a little safe and secure area for the practice. Okay. I'm That's picturing typically- like wrappers of healthy surprise, like you make this nest of – no. That would just make it better. Right. <laughs> you can do that. But um, it's uh, usually like a yoga mat and some pillows. Okay. And you know, just kind of like a little comfortable area to, to practice with. And then the man – they've got some protocols to kind of go through it so it's – it's kind of structured and it, um, it's a group know, class movies. though, right? It's like, what? it's a group class. Like there's multiple people or is this done in the practice of your own home? <clears throat> Both. So, oh. so oming is a practice between two people and then they have what, uh, you saw, which is the Om practice club, which is kind of like a, uh, organized meeting of, of practitioners of oming okay. that can come together and find other partners and practice together. But I didn't get to what it is. Yeah, go it's ahead. It's essentially pussy stroking. Really? But they would refer to it colloquially. Yeah, and it's um, it's 15 minutes of like a very specific but not very complicated uh, stroking of the clitoris. Wow. And this you do this in a group, like uh, a room full of people. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So was that hard at first to like be in a room full of people in this intimate, you know, with your significant other or no? Um, by the time I got to the Ohm class session yeah. environment, uh, it wasn't really hard for me because I, I've been doing work uh, by myself and my partner and kind of yeah. sexual exploration and, and enlarging my my idea of what is uh, like shameless sex. I think our culture has a huge, huge amount of, of baggage and shame. It just kind of puts on everybody about sex. Right. And I've been working for a long time to kind of diffuse that and untangle that in my own brain. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, for me, it wasn't like a big deal. Hmm. But, you know, you go to one of these kind of like first time ohm classes where they bring on a bunch of people who have never been there before. And, you know, on the one hand, it's people that are at a ohm class so right. they're not exactly the most prudish people that they, they kind of know what they're getting into a little bit yeah but yeah. but that's about it though they're not like you know like porn stars that are like super experienced in this so right. it, it tends to be people that are right on the edge and uh, yeah. uh for a lot of them it's it can be very terrifying right. um or just like very intense experience to see kind of like a group sex yeah uh, environment so wow for me, it wasn't. It's not too big of a deal, but it can be intense for a lot of people. Yeah. See, I never thought in a million years this is the direction of where this our conversation would go. But you know, the, you have so many fascinating pictures and hobbies. Like I have to bring some of this stuff up because I find it really interesting. And there's also a picture with you in in a room 
it almost looks like a temple with skulls. You okay. know what I'm referring to? What is that? The, so the skulls are on a table, right? Yeah, there's skulls are on a table. There's like skulls or some bones. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. Um, so that uh, that was a shamanic psychedelic uh, ceremony that I attended in Peru. Um, I mean... So what was that like? Well, whatever you kind of are conjuring with the pictures... Yeah, yeah. It was like 10 thousand times more intense uh than what it looks like it was a, it was a, a very very amazing profound experience i was very lucky to participate in did you go there knowing that's what you're gonna do or were you just traveling in peru and you stumbled upon this i i my friend uh aubrey marcus invited me down hmm. to i've heard to- of aubrey yeah 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 so he uh invited me to go with him um and some other people down to peru to meet this shaman that he uh, really likes, this guy Don Howard, who's incredible. Hmm. And, you know, Aubrey's a seasoned guy, and I trust him. And he said, look, you got to come down here and see what this guy's cooking up. Right. And I didn't, you know, I didn't need to go much deeper than that. I mean, I, I knew the medicines that this guy worked with. Yeah. But I didn't really expect to be in the, you know, temples of the, of the temples of doom with like, <laughs> skulls it literally looks like that that killed people and jaguar skulls and it was you know yeah it was it was super crazy and intense man and 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 that's you know while you're on some of the most powerful psychedelics in the world and uh the reason that those images are so evocative to us and like powerful is because they are you know i mean there's there's a reason that the skulls are charged so with a very seasoned practitioner like this guy and the right medicine um I mean, these things converge to create a very, very powerful experience. Yeah. So what did you, what realizations or, you know, thoughts came after that experience for you? Because that seems like a life-changing, once-in-a-lifetime type of experience. Yeah, it's both of those things, yeah. sure. Um, I had so many, man. I mean, so many different things uh came out of that but if i had to i mean after that do you write in a journal like to get everything down like what's your what do you do so you don't forget all these things that are running through your head well you forget a lot of them yeah uh, because that's the nature of the experience i mean almost like dreaming that you can't bring it all back right and when you do very powerful psychedelic uh you know medicines that create these kind of mystical states the experience that I have and I think a lot of people share is that the immensity of the experience, it's so profound and so overwhelming and so the bandwidth is so, so much that when you return here to, you know, the default consensus reality, right. uh, words seem like like a insufficient trivial way to try to describe you can't it. You know, express like it. one word after the other you know mm. it's like if uh, you went onto a web page and downloaded a web page today like the New York Times it might be like a 50 megabyte file for like all the images and all these things and then if you were like okay now, now I want you to describe those 50 megabytes to me in human language like right. one word after the other I mean, it's just like, it seems so inconsequential. You know, I'm going to be here for, for six years like, reading off like a million <laughs> descriptors, you know? Right. So you come back and someone's like, what's it like? And you're just kind of right. God, you know? I, I think that's why a lot of people say they, they see angels or they see the divine because we don't really have good language around these experiences. And no. uh, you know, the Eskimos have like 50 words for snow. Right. Um, We've got like God. So when you have this, the immensity of this experience, you know, for some people that means it's a guy in a robe who's judging you. For for the Buddhists, you know, it means just a, a sense of contentment. The Taoists would say it's where everything's growing from. I mean, there's all different ways to kind of slice this idea of of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, what about from? A, um, we'll make it easier, right? Anything from a business standpoint that struck you that you went in and did in your business because of this experience? <clears throat> hmm. 
from a business standpoint. I mean, the, one of the biggest takeaways from, from that kind of work is that this here, this life that we're in right now, mm-hmm. is really like a, it's, it's a game and I feel it's like a buffet of pleasures. You know, like if I go to Whole Foods and I walk around and there's like 20,000 different foods and things and each of them tastes different and all of them taste good, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, for most people, you know, yeah. everything, everyone likes everything, but it's it's almost blissful to be able to, to have all of these different, you know, tastes and flavors and and I look at business as an extension of, of that of that theory that, you know, we're typically told by the culture that, you know, you work and like you do this job and it kind of sucks. And then after a long time of it sucking, you're going to retire. So you're going to stop doing the sucky thing and then you're going to do what you really want to do. Right. And that's the more conventional narrative. Whereas uh, for myself, um, I look at, uh, you know, business is a way to do fun things that normally I wouldn't ever be able to do. So for example, um, you know, I, I don't know you too well, but I don't think people could just write you a check and say, Hey, you, you know, I, I've been a, a floor sweeper for the last, you know, 50 years, but I want to be on your show. Like, that's not really interesting. You're not going to really want to have that person on there just because they say, Hey, I'm going to give you money. So right, right. Uh, in order to have these kind of like real cool experiences, like winning a Grammy or, you know, jumping on, out of a, like that guy who did the, like jumped out of the highest balloon ever <laughs> or going to the show or meet musicians or, you know, per, travel the world and tour as a rock star. Those are all things you do because of like professional achievement and the, you know, from that standpoint, as opposed to just like working. So yeah. when you go back and for me, having that kind of real, uh, per, big, it gives you a lot of perspective of like what's going on and what's important and, and how the, the little things can be trivial. So coming back to that, I kind of try to bring that back to me as much as I can. Was when you're here, you know, we're scared of a lot of things. I'm going to run out of money. My girlfriend's not going to love me. You know, I'm going to get hit by a car. There's all these these problems and things we we wrap ourselves with normally, uh, and it's easy for to forget. Uh, yeah. for me yeah. and for everybody that, hey, you know what, maybe the point of being here is to have fun and try to explore all the the pleasures that are available to us. Yeah. So it gave you a huge sense of perspective in general. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. yeah. Um, you know, and the other thing is I saw, I don't even know, it's you with a gun. Um, I don't know if it's in Africa or something. Yeah. Sure. Was that uh, one of your travel escapades also? Yeah, I've been all over. Yeah, I've done a lot of traveling. Um, that was I did a, a safari in uh, Kenya. Hmm. Uh, as I was working my way down to Tanzania, where I I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, so I, I spent some hmm. time in Africa. And actually, my time in Africa was where I learned the word jambo, which is which is the greeting in Swahili. It's hello. It's a hmm. very fun word. Everyone's jambo, jambo, jambo. So that's where the that name came jambo, from. Jambo, got it. Yeah. Yeah, but that specific photograph was at a uh, game reserve, like a national park in, I believe it was Tanzania or Kenya, and uh, that was one of the, um, I don't know, like uh, game warden is really the, maybe the, the word, but it was one of the guys who like, you know, protects the elephants, and they're all mm. armed to the teeth because the, uh, the poachers are all armed too, so it's like a full-on war, and you know... Yeah, I heard a little bit about this. It's super dangerous. Yeah, yeah, it's very dangerous down there. Wow. Um, so where were you at? What business were you running at the time or what were you doing in business when you went to, to Kenya? Well, Kenya, I was um, I was working with my father. So I was in the construction world and that was kind of like a lifetime ago. I was I was living in Florida. I was on the East Coast. And that trip really was one of the things that got me to really kind of examine what I was doing and what I wanted to do with my life. I did a lot of journaling, and I realized uh, on that trip that, you know, working in this, uh, you know, working for my father um, and kind of being groomed to take over this business was like a fantastic opportunity, and, and it was a wonderful business. And in a lot of ways, it would have been easier than kind of like, what I did, which was basically pack up everything in my truck and drive out to California. Right. Um, but, you know, 
as much as that kind of what would have been a, like an easier, cushier thing, I just realized it wasn't for me. I needed to go out and kind of break out and be my own man and, and do my own thing. And now looking back, you know, three businesses later and all these crazy experiences that we're talking about, I think it was the right decision right. and to stay, you know, in my hometown and, and work right. in the family business. Yeah. So did you go, what made you decide to go to Africa in the first place? Were you trying to contemplate this type of life change or? Well, in this instance, this trip that we're talking about, it was my second trip to Africa. Mm, oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, no, wait, no, no, no. I'm sorry. It was my second trip to India. Mm. What happened was I, I spent some time in India a while ago, maybe 10 years, 15 years ago now. I spent like two, almost two months there. And my brother, like five years ago, or my God, now maybe 10 years ago, uh, he, he had a business partner in, in Delhi, and his business, business partner was getting married. And I had been all over the world, you know, at this point, I mean, you know, 20, 30 countries. But my brother had only been in maybe like Mexico. And He's like, parents, I need you, brother. I need you to guide me. No, no, no. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. my parents said, hey, we don't want, your, you know, Matt to go abroad, you know, and I'm saying by himself, he's, he's younger than me and said, you know, you've been all over. Will you, mm. will you go with him? Yeah. And I said, no, I won't go because India, you know, parts of it are, I don't want to disparage India, but some of the cities are really dirty and gross and Delhi specifically. I mean, it was bad back then. I think now it's maybe the most polluted city in the world. Mm. And the idea of, you know, traveling 20, 30 hours to go to like the, one of the most polluted cities in the world was not really something I was going to do in my life at that point. Right. And they said, you know, please, you know, go with them. And I said, well, I said, that scared, that but- scared him even more, Joe, by the way. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> <laughs> you're a very adventurous, but you're like, I won't go there. So, yeah, well, it wasn't that it was dangerous. It was just, it was just gross. Yeah. Um, but I said, you know what? Okay. I'll go as long as it's, it's in part of like a bigger adventure. Mm. Right. Yeah. So then <clears throat> I decided, okay, what would be a badass adventure to do? I'm going to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Mm. And then, you know, then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I'm going to be in Africa. I might as well do the safari. So then the Africa thing kind of became the sun. It was like the center of the solar system. And then the India trip was like an ancillary mm. part of it, you know? So in that way, I kind of justified to myself, okay, I'm already going to go all the way across the world to go to Africa. Then we'll just shoot over to Delhi for a couple of days and do the wedding. Right. Yeah. And your was your brother's eyes really opened after that experience? Because if he's only been to Mexico and then you take him on this African trip and then to India. Yeah, man. I, I mean, it, it'd be really hard for any any Western American or American Western Western American or mm-hmm. uh, no, any American Westerner to to go to the, to Africa and go to a couple countries and then go to India and not have your 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 perspective um enlarged I, I mean i've been all over on that trip what was really interesting was that the gentleman who's getting married he was upper class the brahmin and the wedding was you know like this upper class brahmin wedding yeah. and uh they just had so many so many people like working and like doing things for them that mm. were you would never do it in america because even though like minimum wage, it's still like, it's still expensive, you know, but there's so many people there and they're so inexpensive that the thing that struck me was that they had this parade with fireworks and like elephants and, you know, marching band. I mean, it was like this massive parade that, that marched like, you know, a half mile or something, but along the whole marching route, there were Indian men in full dress and it wasn't cool out it was hot like in these you know kind of like steward outfits holding these big lamps and they were like big lamps you'd see in like a you know convention hall or like maybe someone's like formal dining room and they just had like extension cords like strung along along mm. you know along the whole way and there were these dudes just sitting there like for hours just holding these lamps and there were so many of them and it just kind of gave me this context of like wow like I'm at the rich dude's wedding who's got elephants and fireworks and like, you know, his bride was like in a litter with jewels all over. And then there was like a thousand of these like mm-hmm. untouchable slaves basically. And, you know, right or wrong, 
no judgment on that. I'm just saying that like to see that definitely changes your perspective. You know, you yeah. come back to the yeah. States and you're like, okay, wow, that's just a totally different culture over there. Yeah. yeah. So Joe, where's your next trip, trip. to? Uh, well, now with work um, and everything, I'm traveling constantly. Some of them are more exciting than others. I, I just was in Oakland and Denver. <laughs> You're like Africa, Oakland. Let me see. Yeah. So, so those ones aren't um, right. too crazy. Uh, but on the more crazy side, I, I'm hoping to get down to Peru again hmm. um, in the summer uh, to go drink some ayahuasca. So that will be another. That was a little. We'll be, I'll have some more. Some more meat to, to to fling to your readers when I get back. You know, I just interviewed. Uh, I don't know if you heard of Wim Hof before. So he, um, yeah. So he, because it made me think of we were talking about Mount Kilimanjaro, and he's taking like twenty eight people to the summit in just their shorts and shoes or something. So maybe. Yeah, uh, so, so when I summited it, yeah. I was wearing like seven like jackets on. I mean, really? I had a, I, it was almost like a space suit. You had so much clothes because. It's so cold when you're up there, yeah. and then the top of it is a glacier, right? And you climb up, and it takes hours and hours and hours, and it's like minus twenty degrees up on the on the top of it, right? So to go up there in your in your shorts, you know that's uh, you know, but he's the Hoff; he can do it exactly. You know, there was one um, where you went to Dixie Elixir. Um, yeah. I just noticed. So tell me, what are some of the takeaways from that? Because you, you said, um, I think in the post that it's the world's largest infused edible company. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that there's like a Forbes ranking, but <laughs> I think they've raised about, and you know, someone can right. go check this, but I, I yeah. think it's you know, 20, 30, 40 million dollars, yeah. a huge amount of capital. We'll say it's one, one of the ones up there. So, but yeah. But yeah. I, I I try to I'm in a position now where I got to be careful about my okay. words because, like, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later. But but with that with healthy surprise and the health claims, you know, if you say something's vegan, the the vegans, you know, they know. But um, so Dixie, uh, I mean, will probably be interesting to a lot of the, the listeners is that if you go to Colorado and you uh, spend any time with with people that are in the industry or go to any of the places. Um, they're just so like, it's not a big deal. Like it's just another day at work right. and like, yeah, it's a plant or, you know, chopping this one down or putting right. it in cardboard boxes and we're, you know, doing accounting and HR and it's just like, whatever. But when I go back home to Florida, uh, which is where I'm from yeah, and I tell people I'm in the cannabis business, you know, they, they, their heads shrink a little bit. They, they look around and they can cannabis and they're, they're, their voices drop in a little hushed tone. <laughs> and, uh, it's just such a different And you world. open your coat up and you're like, do you want any of the... No. <laughs> <laughs> um, only in places where it's legal to do that. Right. I, right. Would, I would never <laughs> do that in a state where uh, you know, it was illegal. But um, yeah, there's the fact that, which the, that people are operating with such comfort and at such scale. You know, um, I've, I've started quite a few businesses. Uh, I've raised some money. Um, but... You know, raising tens of millions of dollars, building out a multi-million dollar facility. You know, it's it's that's a big it's a big scale. I mean, I, don't know, I think they have like fifty to hundred employees. Yeah. So they're 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 operating a cannabis business at scale. And, and what's cool about that is that I don't think it's really ever been done before. You know, in, in a legal fashion. I mean, I'm sure the cartels operate, but unless you seem like Breaking Bad or something, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say legally. Um, so what's neat is that they're, you know, they're trailblazing it. Uh, one of the things that's yeah. real fun and uh, very difficult in being in the cannabis space is that there are there are no mentors, there's no trailblazers, mm. nobody on it. You know, you can't even call a lawyer and say like, hey, you know, what do we know, do? Federal law says no, and the state law says yes, and like, what does it mean? Nobody knows, you know, and. I'm this little. I'm not going to be able to use this spiel anymore. Maybe in a year or two, because people are starting to know, and it's starting to get figured out. But, and I've been in it for a couple of years now, and it's just, it's it's just so murky, and so you just got to keep going forward. Which is a meta uh, lesson in business, as I'm sure you know. I mean, it's the entrepreneurial challenge, but it's like, it's it's like 10x in the cannabis space because you have all this risk. There's a lot of legal, you know, it's not clear legally. 
and stuff like that. Well, it's not. Yeah, it's not clear. Yeah. You don't have access to the to the post office. You don't have access to the banking system. You don't have access to a lot of um, t- you know talent. Capital is very very difficult to get. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of challenges that make it even even more difficult. But yeah. so these guys in Dixie, you know, they fought through. I mean, we're fighting through it, but but they fought through it, and um, that was kind of inspiring just to see, you know, that it's happening. It's happening at a big level. Yeah. And so, were you going there too for market research purposes for Jumbo Superfoods? <clears throat> um, yeah. I mean, we're we're growing and. Uh, our our hope and vision is to be able to operate a facility, um, hopefully in California, where we can be as let's say compliant as they are. So you know they're operating this big thing, lots of employees, and they're not worried about you know the SWAT team coming in and arresting everybody and doing all that. Um, California, uh, and you know we can go as deep into the to the details of it as you want. Yeah, go ahead. It. Yeah, but there's all kinds of different conflicting rules and laws, and it's created uh, what they in the industry they literally call California the wild wild west. It's almost like the, the industry term, and they almost disparagingly like Colorado is like you know they get it all figured out, and they're using the, they have the rules or whatever, and it's like all these crazy you know cowboys in California because there's not a lot of law, there's not a lot of regulation. Um, and there's conflicting stuff. So, so California can go in and anyone can buy it, right? Because I think I believe in Illinois, I'm in Chicago. Oh, you can't. No, um, you can't. So California has a uh, has a medical marijuana program in mm. place for about 20 years now, and pretty much anybody can go get a, a doctor's recommendation. You you need so, a doctor's prescription. You need a doctor's recommendation. And um, they're not particularly difficult to get, you know. Uh, it's pretty much if you can find that the plant is beneficial to you, yeah. And you don't have any contraindicating, you know, things, yeah. uh, and you're not crazy, and you know the doctor doesn't think you're gonna, you're, 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 uh, you know, a risk to yourself. Then yeah, you can get a recommendation and you can go get it. Um, it's still controlled and there's a framework, but you know, there's like for example. Uh, in the state of California, we've got about 11 pages of law divided among maybe like four or five different documents. So there's like a two-page bulletin from the um, – I forget the name – but the revenue department that like collects the taxes and, and they, they did a bulletin like about how to pay taxes. And then the attorney general under Schwarzenegger issued like a seven-page bulletin of about like – how your corporation should be set up and some of the rules and the way that he interprets it. Then we've got like a paragraph from the constitutional amendment in the 90, like 94. We've got SB 420, which is like two or three paragraphs. So in aggregate, when you put all the law together, you've got, you know, like 10 pages of guidance. So, okay, 10 pages. It's not like 10 words. I mean, it's got some stuff in there. But the word edibles never mentioned in anything, Yeah. right? So that's just not even listed. Now, if we go to Colorado... Uh, I think they got like a hundred pages just on edibles. You know what I mean? Mm. About testing them and labeling, and you know how many milligrams and da 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 da. Right. So they got this whole uh, corpus of you know regulation and guidance and how to be compliant and pay your taxes, whatever. Whereas in California, it's very gray because it's clearly legal to do. <clears throat> it's a multi-billion-dollar industry. There's over a thousand dispensaries, possibly in LA alone. So I mean, you're talking about a huge business. Thousands, tens of thousands of people are involved in it. Lots of money moving. Right. Um, right. But yet, some people are getting arrested. Some stores are getting closed down. And wow. It's just like people don't really understand why. I've been in it for two years. I don't really fully understand them. I, I have some guesses as to why the SWAT teams, you know, smashing people's businesses and stealing all their stuff. Um, but you know, the good news is that as, as, as much as that is where it is, uh, the, the assembly, the California assembly passed, uh, AB 266 and governor Jerry Brown signed it, uh, along with two other bills. And those three together will create, um, like the department of marijuana regulation or whatever they're going to call it. And that will come online in the next couple of years. And then they will be able to craft, you know, a whole series of regulations so we can have our government red tape too. Um, right. I, I say that half-heartedly. I mean, I mean, there needs to be some more regulation than what we have now right. to bring some clarity and, you know, stop these, these silly arrests. 
so that's coming, you know, that's coming. But right now, California is is definitely not as regulated as some of the other states. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, now Healthy Surprise, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, this is part of the Scubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation from inventory management to what products are actually profitable and much more. Today, I'm very excited. We have Joe Winky. He's the founder of three companies, Healthy Surprise, which is a subscription healthy snack box, the Dirt Personal Care Company, which sells high quality personal items. I'm going to have to have you talk about the toothpaste, Joe because I saw the video, it's pretty cool, and Jumbo Superfoods Company, which is high-quality herbal and cannabis-infused edibles. Joe's been featured on the Wall Street Journal, Oprah.com, Playboy.com, many others. Joe, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's awesome. So first of all, you know, powdered toothpaste. Tell me about the toothpaste a little bit. Well, we have two products. The tooth powder is... uh, a product and now we have a toothpaste which which is new we started with a tooth powder it's actually where the name of the company came from uh my partner shannon she developed this tooth powder uh and it was making a mess if you use it it's great but if you spit it out and you don't really rinse out the whole sink and like really kind of do that after a few days uh the sink's gonna get dirty and you know we were i said i said shannon i said this is gonna be a problem People are going to come to us and say, look, this tooth powder is great, but it's making my whole place you know, a mess. And she said, oh, no, it's going to – I said, look, I, I have dealt with a lot of customer service in my businesses, and we got to like somehow get ahead of this. So yeah. I thought – I said, why don't we do this? Let's name the company The Dirt because it's dirty and it's going to create a mess. And then if someone calls to us and says, hey, you know, my sink is dirty because of your dirt toothpaste <laughs> – well, then I figured, what can they say? I mean, so we took the weakness and made it into a strength. Right. And um, that's how the company got its its name. And then we started with a dirt tooth powder, which is an incredible product. It's really how people used to brush their teeth. The, the pasty um, you know, thing in a tube that everybody knows nowadays uh, is not what the Romans were using or the, you know, the Greeks way back in the day or the Egyptians. So a tooth powder is kind of old school. Um, but we had so many requests for a paste that we finally developed one. It took over a year of a research and development really? because were you surprised? At yeah, that? well, no, not really because um, it's awesome. It's an incredible product, and a lot of times, like really great stuff, is a lot of work. Yeah. You know, so I wasn't, I wasn't as surprised as my partner Shannon was, who really kind of is the formulator, and she wanted to quit a bunch and was just saying this is taking too long and it's too much effort. And I said, I hear you, but you got to keep going be because this it. is going to be incredible. Yeah. What so, took so um, long? Most well, most toothpaste uses um, glycerin. It's kind of like the, uh, the the agent they use to keep it um it binds pasty. together or something. Yeah. And they use a bunch of other stuff. I mean, there's fluoride and there can be um, mm. in Crest and some of the, the big ones. Um, there's plastics in there, like literally polyethylene is one of the ingredients on some of the crest ones. Like you get some of those toothpaste and they're all sparkly. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's like what's the what are those sparkles? You know, I mean, I don't know what you know, (laughs) natural occurring, you know, like plant is going to be sparkly. So um, we didn't want to do that in the conventional way. So we use uh, MCT oil, which which is a fraction of coconut oil, and uh, we kind of have a proprietary mix. Um, but it's incredible. She's yeah. really good at formulations. Our our best selling flavor is rose cacao mint. It's a really interesting combination mm. of, of of flavors. And uh, my friend said it's like like uh, brushing with royalty. And uh, it, it's a really neat um, different take on what you know. Everybody's been brushing their teeth with with minty kind of conventional toothpaste and putting fluoride and plastic. And you, you know you think you're spitting it out, but 
you're not spitting it all out. So yeah. Um, anyways, it's 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 a real cool thing, and uh, it's it's really taken off. Why right toothpaste, now. Joe? Why why did she start the the journey of creating a toothpaste? Okay, so that's a, a bigger question. It kind of falls into the, the arc of my my story yeah. you know, without going into the whole long. Uh, Go as long or as short as you want. Yeah, I'll give you the abbreviated version, and then and I'll punctuate it, and then and then if you have questions, you can ask. Sure. But basically, you know, I got into personal development. I got into business um, when I was younger, like at school. I had a mentor, my friend Scott Friedman. He gave me some really good books on investing, and then I wanted to learn more about like you know business and management. And I kind of read all the the business books not all of them but you start reading enough of them and then you start hearing like the same the messages over and over, and over again, yeah right and then, um i got into and then i realized okay well business is good but to like run your business real well i gotta get up early so like how do i get up early well i gotta do personal development and i gotta get disciplined and you know take care of myself so then i started reading books about personal discipline and then how old were you same at this thing. time what like is this when you're in high school or what? 20s or Okay. Yeah, yeah, like college. Because you grew up in a pretty early. entrepreneurial family, it sounded like. Your dad had his own business, right? Yeah, my dad uh, is definitely a businessman and a, been a great mentor for me. So got into started reading, uh, reading about personal development. And then much in the same way that the business led me to the personal development, the personal development led me to, to health because – you know, you may have all the discipline to get up in the morning, but if you're sick and you know you don't, you're not vital, it's really hard to get up and have the stamina to you know kind of push through because my journey, my entrepreneurial journey, is a high energy, high bandwidth thing. I mean, I'm I wake up early and I'm going all day and, yeah. and I love it, but it's because I my, my yeah. body, is, my temple, and my spaceship is in great condition. What time then, do you usually I, wake up in the morning? I usually get up around six thirty or seven. Okay, no alarms. I eliminated the alarm from my life like ten years wow. ago. It was it was it was on the on the I don't even know if it's the bucket list, but it was on like the the list of things I needed to do as right. a, is like being my, my own man and being an entrepreneur. So yeah, I just get up, I wake do up. You I go just, to bed early, or what time do you usually head to bed? Because I don't know if I can actually wake up with no alarm without kids. Um, you know, at six thirty. Why? What do you mean? Why couldn't you? I, I don't know. I mean, my kids wake me up. You know, five thirty, six o'clock. So it doesn't matter. So I've never tested. <laughs> but yeah, but if you went to bed early enough, yeah, right? that's why yeah. I ask. What time? What time are you going to bed to to wake up that time? Um, it almost doesn't matter too much now really? at this point. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of just pop up out of bed. I okay. So one of the things I've noticed in my life is that there will be a moment. There are these little like. I hope the Germans or the Japanese probably have a word for this, but I can describe it better with food. There's a moment when I'm eating, and I'll be like eating at a restaurant on a big plate of food, and I'll eat like 80% of it, and I get this just little flash of like, you can stop eating now, it's like, and then it's gone, right? And I, and then I'll look at the food, and there's like you know like four more bites, and I'm like, well, <laughs> what am I gonna do? Box up these four little bites? You know what I mean? I'm not just gonna throw it away. Right. It just tastes so good. My lips. So then you just eat it, you know? Right. But I've realized that, like, if I can just seize on that little moment and stop, that's usually, like, that, that little 20% that's going to be the, the love handles. You know what I mean? Like, that's your body telling you. But then your body can always eat more. Right. I found it took me years to get to even notice that little, like, flash when it occurs. And it mm. almost always occurs when I, I'm eating in a place where there's more food than I need. Right. And, right. and, you know, many times I'll eat. But I've also noticed that I get that same experiential flash in the evening, in the late evening, where it's like you could just lay down and go to bed now. Mm. Instead, I'm watching a movie with my girl, or I'm, you know, I'm working on a project and I'm doing something, yes. and I'm like, well, I might as well just finish the movie. And finishing the movie is like those last extra bites gotcha. you need. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I need you're, to listen to that more often. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying it's like you're telling yourself a story that like I can't do this, but. Really, yeah. if you just I like, like that you challenged me on that, Joe. I like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely go to bed way too late. That's a, that's you know an issue. Well, and then and then yeah. and then too late. That's just a judgment. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like you go to bed whenever you wherever you want to go to bed or whenever you want to wake up. I mean, <laughs> too yeah, late. I just consider sure. like two hours from when I'm supposed to wake up. You know, that's well. Yeah. The reason I like the mornings, yeah. and this is probably different with children. I don't have them, so I don't know. Yeah. But I feel that like when I wake up. When I wake up 
and I'm the first one up in the house and I got the whole place to myself, I am in complete control of me. Right. Right? If I want to do yoga, I do yoga. If I want to have a cup of tea, I have a cup of tea. If I want to work on my taxes, whatever I want to do, I do that. <laughs> that wouldn't cross my mind of what I would do, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I like getting it done. Right, right. Uh, so then once people start coming in, then there starts to be demands on me. So like, hey, you know, Joe, how do I do this? Da, 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 da. Text messages. Oh, now I have to respond to this. Emails. And I look at it as like you peak of your of your your own dictate of your own energy at the beginning of the day. Yeah. And then yeah. it, it diminishes out over time because there's more and more demands and people then, you know, you're in traffic. So like if you think you're gonna be at this place at six o'clock, oh no, you're not. Like traffic's gonna make you be there late. I mean there's all these other external energies right. that come to bear on you. So um, that's one of the reasons I've I've kind of in, intellectually shifted my, my life to be a little bit more early yeah. because I like that ability to have that time where I, I can do what I want to do. Yeah. And so you were talking, you went from the personal development to then the health, right, on this, going back to the toothpaste, why the, why the toothpaste? Okay, yeah. So, um, so then I get on the, kind of the health kick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's where Healthy Surprise came in. Right. At that period of my life, just in kind of the time. So let's table. talk about that for a second. You know, okay. we talked earlier, and you said you basically drove cross country, right? Yeah. So what were you thinking and expecting when you got in your car from this was from Florida to you were going to California, right? When I I was working with my father, yeah, a family business, yeah. and I decided I kind of wanted to go do my own, be my own man, so to speak. Right. And uh, what was I thinking? Yeah, what were you – I mean, did you have something in mind? Like, oh, I'm going to start this. So like a, in terms of a business? Yeah, yeah. I thought I was going to – I don't mean it like in a rude way. Like, what were you thinking? But, yeah, no, no, that's yeah. right. I thought I was going to I was gonna end up in either Boulder uh -huh. or San Francisco okay. because that was what the, the media had told me where, where the startups were. I gotcha. And I was going to go do a startup. That's what I knew. So I, 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 did, I had a couple ideas – uh, for you know startups, I, I hadn't like walked in. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna show up to this place and do this thing. Yeah. What were your but ideas I, at the time? Oh, well, I don't know if I can give you ideas plural, but but the idea that that I ended up going with um, was uh, a company that I worked on but never launched called This Is Backpacking .com. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, so yeah, you were thinking about that at the time on your drive also. Yeah, I got yeah. the idea of, to do that when I was actually um, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro with my brother. Mm. We were we were up like fifteen thousand feet, and my brother asked me to borrow something out of my bag that I had like told him he should have bought like beforehand. And you know what 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 it, how trivial is it for me to go in my bag and get out this little battery charger or whatever to give it to give it to you? Well, it's a trivial thing until you're at 15,000 feet and you're climbing one of the tallest mountains in the world and every single movement is like a very draining thing. Right. And um, I guess I was also just – I was just kind of bitchy and I, and I shouldn't have been. <laughs> it just like – it, just, it just – You had less oxygen or something. We'll, we'll yeah, I had a lot less oxygen yeah. and it hit me deep in the crevice of my brain that it just bothered me that like I was like, oh man, this guy like doesn't have this thing that he should have had. And that one experience which – I guess was kind of a negative, but it, I, I transmuted that into the idea that when people go on these journeys, um, you know, they typically don't know what they're going to need on the top of this mountain, for example. Right. And I've been to over 30 countries and I've been on a lot of crazy places. So I kind of have some domain knowledge about what you need. Um, and that was kind of the idea was to create a service that could partner with people that would put together like a, um, a mountain climb or a safari or some kind of you know journey across Siberia, and um, be able to work with them and say, okay, what, what's what's the equipment that people are going to need? This is backpacking would go source all that information, all that stuff, and then when you're booking your trip, uh, they could say, okay, you know, thanks for booking the trip. Um, you're going to need to be bring a bunch of stuff, here's the five-page PDF with all the right. items you need to bring, right. or go to thisisbackpacking.com and put in trip code you know, 123, and you can just in two seconds buy all the stuff versus going to 20 stores and ordering online. So uh, I thought it was a great business idea. I still think it's a great business idea. Um, 
but that was kind of the rough idea of what I would, thought I was going to do in either San Francisco or Boulder. But then at the end of the day, because you really have no clue what's really going to happen in your life, right. I ended up in Los Angeles doing HealthySurprise.com. So what um, when you were driving cross country, did you end up and stop in Boulder and then go on? Or did you just go, what made you to decide to actually end up in L.A.? I don't think I ever made it to Boulder, but we, we I definitely got to L.A., and LA, if you if you take the ten, I think I think it's a ten all the way. I think you can pick it up in like Atlanta, and you can take it all the way across the country, literally to Santa Monica, like on the beach. So it mm. goes the whole way, and so you're kind of like you're kind of gonna go into to Los Angeles. You know what I mean? I mean you right. can you can go right around it, but Los Angeles is an incredible place. Right. I highly recommend it. I have a, I have some some pet peeves with it. I can really bitch about this place. <laughs> But it's a it's a crazy bitch that you can't leave. It's wonderful, and uh, <laughs> and so I ended up in in LA to go there. And then what the reason I went there and the reason I stayed, you know, eventually was that my college roommate. And this was like five, ten years out of out of college. But my my original college roommate was living in Beverly Hills, and he had an extra bedroom. Hmm. And he told me he said, "Hey, I have this extra bedroom. Just come stay with me." And so I was driving like two, three weeks across the country. Like sold. <laughs> yeah, I had no. I had a friend with me. We, we were stopping in New Orleans and partying, and Austin right. and partying, and Tucson and Vegas. You know, we're just kind of driving along, and that Sounds was like, like the fun. next place. Yeah. yeah, it was like okay, now come to LA and you have a free place to stay. And we're like, fantastic, we're coming. Um, but then I I went to Santa Monica, and I mean Santa Monica is so incredible, and the tech scene was just just starting to occur in Los Angeles right when I got there. I got there at the, at the, at the perfect moment for that. And um, that combination of the beauty of um, of Santa Monica, the start of the tech scene, and, the, and really startups, which is what I was looking for anyways. Yeah. And then the fact that my old college roommate was there, I had been visiting him for 10 years, flying out. And so I kind of like knew all of his friends. Mm. So I had a network, you know what I mean? Where, where, so I was like, I was there. I was like, okay, wow, I'm, I'm situated. Versus going to San Francisco, I knew no one. Right. So right. it was kind of like easy to say, okay, you know, I'm in a cool place. I can do the startup here. I got friends, and did, here I am. Did you feel pressed to make money and get a job, or did you have some runways so that you can test out ideas that you wanted to run with at the time? Yeah, I had um, I had a good amount of runway, so I had saved up okay. uh, uh, quite a bit of money. I was working in the family business. Uh, we, we did construction. This was in the early aughts, uh, so we had the boom was going on, and I started. Um, I kind of started a division at the at, in my family business where we were selling standby generators, and I had done you know pretty well for myself. I had you know a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank, so I had some runway. I had basically no expenses, um, and I had some kind of contracting work I knew I could do to like bring some a little mm. bit of money in. So I, I was you know I wasn't. You know, now looking five years later, what, you know, understanding what it is to be capitalized. Like I, I wasn't like super capitalized to go do a big startup, but for me to do what I, I wanted to do, I could go out there and I, you know, I knew I could sustain myself for a you, while. Yeah, so. yeah. So you you started this business, I think before, but it really launched at the startup weekend, right? Healthy surprise. Yeah, healthy surprise. Yeah. So I was working on this backpacking idea. Yeah. I had been working on it for about. Uh, eight, ten months or okay, whatever. So wow, yeah, yeah. And then, and then they were having. I was working at this place called the Coloft, which was like ground zero for the tech community, yeah. the startup scene. And they were doing all these, having all these events there. And one of them was the Startup Weekend event, where you try to launch a startup in a weekend. And I, I ended up doing three of them. The first two, I went and just kind of participated. And then by the third one, I was like, okay, I kind of got this thing figured you got out. Your like, footing a little bit. Yeah, and, and I had I had an idea for this healthy surprise, and I knew how like the game was played for this for this this event, and I said, well, you know what? Screw the rules of the game. Like if I kind of because most people go there with nothing, just an idea. Right. I said, well, if I spend like ten hours beforehand and scaffold out like what exactly a designer should do and what exactly a developer should do and like get a couple like roadmaps for them. You basically get like this super high level of talent for free to work on your project for like forty hours in this event. Right. So I, 
if I can just very resourceful of you, yeah. Yeah, it just it just lets you just like, like quantum leap forward, like any idea. Like you have an idea, you're, you're not going to have a hundred employee business at the end of this weekend, but you'll no. have like the website done, the branding's done, you know, yeah. your customers. There's a lot you could do with the with a good team and and you know a free three or four hundred hours of, of labor. Right. So I kind of brought that idea, um, pitched the, the concept, which was, uh, you know, I we talked about health, and that's how we got in this conversation. Yeah, I started taking better care of myself. Eating better, and in, in Los Angeles, I was exposed to this whole world of snack food that was like not horrible for you. Right. And um, I was like, wow, like there is stuff that tastes good, that's good for you, that's available. It's just stuck behind traffic everywhere in Los Angeles. Anywhere I want to go, it's like it's a half an hour, hour of traffic. So I said to myself, well, it would be really brilliant is if I had someone that would just go and buy all this great snack food for me and just give it to me. I don't really care what it is per se. I was more concerned of like the quality standards. Is it healthy? You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, does it not have high fructose corn syrup in it? And it, it's not Twinkies. You know, it's not these things. As long as it's not these things and it tastes good, right. then it's fantastic. So I thought that would be a really easy, fun, low time commitment business to start um, on the side while I was working on the backpacking project. Mm. And so I did this at the startup weekend. The idea got selected. Uh, I built a small team. We were able to uh, enlist, to sign up thirty customers. I went out and I bought Apple that Bonds. night, like during the startup weekend. You enlisted yeah, during the customers. weekend, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went to Whole Foods and I bought snacks and I made the boxes. So we like we ended up signing up like thirty people. We actually sold them the boxes, and then at the end of the event, you know, like I had the website, I had the billing set up, I had the credit cards, I had the bank accounts, mm-hmm. I had all that was it, it going, and then I had these thirty customers that were like going to renew and they were expecting like the next box you know so, so the initial idea joe it was going to be a subscription every month it wasn't like they were getting this one box it was like this is going to be a monthly thing yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I um you know one of the, the main reasons i went out to california was i had read this book uh, i'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with which is the four hour work week sure. by tim Ferriss. yeah and that was one of the things i was really intrigued about was that i was working in construction in Florida, and I don't know if people work in construction, but there's two things that are very fundamental to construction. One is it's location-based, right? Like you're building a house on this piece of land. You have to be on that land to build it. You can't be on a beach you know, in Monaco building your house. So there was that piece about it. Um, and uh, it, was, it, it takes lots of people to, like, to get it done. Mm. Um, so I was kind of like, Traumatized is a strong word, but it maybe makes sense in this context. Traumatized, yeah. <laughs> like having to deal with you know big construction sites and you know tens of hundreds of people and uh, construction workers are salt of the earth people a lot of times, but they're also going to be very rough, you know, dudes who are like very hardcore and um, you know working with a lot of these these people uh, and being you know on a job site for so long. Yeah. I wa- I read this book and it was like, look, you can build this business on the yeah. internet. With no employees, and it just brings in money, right. and you can travel and go anywhere. Right, which and, is the lifestyle that you love and enjoy. Well, yes and no. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but that was the idea: was that I was going to build that kind of business, and Healthy Surprise seemed like it would fit into that model as a subscription. It would be this thing that people would sign up, um, and I loved him and his book, and I, and the book really inspired me to do it. But, and I can't really fault him for this now that I know what I know about marketing, but he kind of undersold the, the amount of work it would take to start the four hour work week. It should be like <laughs> to spend 4,000 hours and if you're lucky and broke, you might end up with a four hour, you know, work week. Right, right. But that, I don't think I would sell That should be the subtitle. <laughs> yeah. You know, the four hour work week, like live and play everywhere with no work. Um, so... Yeah, that's kind of what happened. Is I I started this business at a at an event, and it took off, and um, I basically had to make a decision of, do I go with the one that's working right. that I know is working? So we had customers and they were buying and they were rebuying. They were on subscription, or do I go with the one that I I probably put almost a hundred thousand into the backpacking one at this at this point. Wow. It's hard and, to just turn your back on that after the time. Yeah, of yeah, that. yeah. I mean, we had a, we had a, we had a client 
like who was going to be one of the tour operators. We had like three tour operators that were like were, were onboarded. Yeah. So we were like pretty pretty damn far into the process of launching it and mm. doing it. But then I said, you know, my father taught me this and a lot of the business books will, will tell you is that whatever the statistic is, you know, eight out of ten, nine out of ten businesses fail. Right. So no one starts a business really like – because they think it's going to fail. Everyone thinks they've got like the most brilliant idea. Like this is really going to work. The pet right. rock. So I thought my backpacking thing was going to be brilliant. Right. Um, but I'm not so arrogant to think that I know better than like the laws of the universe, which is like nine out of ten fail. Right. So I, I likened it to like I was building this big rocket, and we were we had, we we're almost done building it. And I thought when I like pushed the ignition switch, it's like, a great analogy, Joe. I love this analogy. Like, yeah. It would shoot off into the sky. Right. But as we know, like every now and then you you push the button on the rocket and the thing blows up on the launch pad. And uh <laughs> held a surprise with like this little Cessna that like was taking off and it you know, it was working. You so saw I said, the okay. traction. Yeah. Yeah, so I said, Well well the the rocket ship's almost done. Why don't I just take the Cessna out for a little bit and see how that goes? And if it doesn't work out, we'll just finish the last ten percent of the rocket ship and we'll take off. Right. Um, so I never got back to finishing the rocket ship. Mm. So I'm going to bring us back. I'm going to finish this story. I, I do this, and, and if you know any of my friends, they'll say I go on these long arcs. Uh, no, this is cool. Uh, the toothpaste. Yeah. Well, can I ask a question on that? I have a question about that before you go on the toothpaste because did anyone stay with you after that startup weekend? To stay on and keep working on it, or was it just no? no. Nobody, nobody wanted to. Hmm. They they had other they had other gigs and other jobs, and they were just doing it as like um you know for fun. Like so, one hmm. of the guys, Mike Brocco, real awesome guy. He was he I don't know if he was working at the time, but he, he was working like a, like a jib jab in some um you know hmm. those like the little heads that move oh, of around. Of course, like, jib jab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was like at a high level position there, and you know he loved it, and and so. You know, he didn't want to go work on this little shitty snack company because he was working for like a real cool startup at the time. Mm, mm. And so, tell me about you know I saw the picture on the story page. Anyone should check out Healthy Surprise, and I think on the there's an our story page with the pictures and a little bit maps out the story a little bit. And what I find interesting is you know thirty boxes. You say thirty boxes, okay? That's it's no, it's a great start. But when you see the 30 boxes lined up on the table, it looks like a lot of boxes, right? Yeah. And you have to actually put all the stuff in those boxes and deliver it, and you've never done this before. So what did that process look like of actually filling those things? Well, this is where I go back to the, 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 the beef I had with Tim about this four-hour work. Okay, thing. yeah, yeah. Go back to what, there, yeah. Well, what it turned into was – uh, and I think I have some photos on that site. But yeah, it's great. I photos, would go yeah. to the loft. I, I found a place called like Box City in Los Angeles, and I could buy these boxes that they worked. And I would load them into the back of my truck. And then at like ten o'clock at night, when everybody cleared out of the co-loft through this co-working space, there'd be some people working late. But I had the like the twenty-four hour pass, and so I would like I would pull up and. It, you know, no one really even knew. I mean, the owners were cool, but I, I would basically take over like the whole place. And just start laying out boxes and snacks everywhere and garbage cans, and I would go to like five in the morning, wow. packing all these boxes. Yeah. So it was a lot of work. I mean, it was, but it's perfect. I mean, anybody that's starting a business, yeah, uh, you kind of need to go through that. Like, yeah. Oh wow! Like, what am I got myself right. into here? And then, and then the mother, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So you know, you do it, and you're like, oh shit! Well, if I had someone to help me, like. This would be better, and then you hire someone. You know what I mean? And then da 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 da. But initially, how did you even know? You know how many products were in each box, and then did you just go to the store? Did you contact the company? What did you do uh, early on when you had these yeah, thirty boxes? Yes. I did. Uh, this what I did. Them. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I went to. I went to. Uh, okay, so it's. A, I went to to Whole Foods, and I figured if I was going to buy a lot of stuff, I could negotiate with them right and i've kind of got that in me that i i, I like to negotiate i understand everything's negotiable right. even at the grocery store right and and what what almost any grocery store will just give you is if you buy a case of something they usually give you about 10 percent off yeah so that's what i did on that weekend was i bought like over 12 of each item mm. so I, at least i you know i wasn't making like a big profit but i at least you know i knew i you know i profit check like i, I was a little bit ahead on, right. on cost of that right um 
And then it was, yeah, it was like, okay, well, now I got 30 people and usually a case is like 12. So that's at least two cases. Like maybe I could buy this, you know, at wholesale. And then there was that whole learning process of like, how do I buy this wholesale? Who do I call? And like, what do I ask for? And just, just the entrepreneurial, you know, journey of just slowly moving down to the point where, you know, I I remember the first time I, I went to, I went to. A, there was a restaurant revolution in Santa Monica that made their own snacks mm. and I would went in I kind of just walked into the kitchen and I'm like you know who's making these snacks <laughs> and then some guy walks out I'm like all right I want you know 500 of them really um, and that's kind of how it how it goes you know because you know we think oh that's great you got customers but then you actually have to fulfill on those on those promises to the customers and that's uh, sometimes easier said than done you know yeah, yeah, definitely, and that, and that's and that's that's where I misjudged, like in the in the bigger sense that I thought this was just going to be like a side project, um, and I was really going to do the backpacking thing, and this was just going to take four hours a week. Uh, mm-hmm. But no, it really became very demanding, and one of the biggest things that I didn't expect, um, and now you know we have three consumer brands, and. Um, so I've really got this lesson is that when you're dealing dealing in any business, but especially consumer facing businesses, there's a huge support element that is kind of like invisible when you start in mm. terms of like customer support. And um, that was like something that was really surprising to me. I didn't expect, you know, especially with when you're mailing things in the post office and it doesn't get delivered and and then you get in there's this whole component of like that you know, I don't control the post office, but I kind of have to answer for all their mistakes. You know, they right. mailman drop it off, then they, people call me. They don't call the post office because you can't call the post office. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, how do you explain those? How do you even handle that? It's like, well, it didn't come. Well, we sent it. Well, it didn't come. It's like a back and forth. Well, that one's a dynamic one. Yeah. Uh, it, it depends on where are we sending it. Uh, but basically, at the end of the day. I've decided that I want anyone who has an interaction with my portfolio of businesses to have a positive interaction. Yeah. And we pretty much eat it. So if if, if we put something in the mail yeah. um, and the post office shows that they picked it up and they've delivered it to this place um, and the people say they don't get it, we usually will, will mail another one out. Yeah. Now, if we put it in the mail and it's going to Abu Dhabi, uh, usually we can get tracking that will say, okay, we got picked up in Los Angeles, it went to New Jersey, it went to New York, and now it's like out of the country, you know, tendered to the Abu Dhabi Express. And then people don't get it. Well, then, I mean, it's like, look, I, I took the box, I gave it to the mailman, they brought it out of the country. You know, I can't control the Abu Dhabi Express, so right. what am I going to do? Th- right. That in that sense, we kind of we, we we push shift the risk over to the customer yeah. because I there's so many mail you know countries we've mailed to that we can't we can't absorb all those. But but basically, yeah, um, yeah. the post office works as our agent, and um, their lack of performance, whether it's fair or not, is translated as to our lack of performance. Right. So to main, kind of maintain our brand standard and that whole experience that I want people to have when they when they work with our customer with our company, um, you know, we'll we'll reissue or remail or whatever we got to yeah. do. So Joe, what was the next? So after those initial thirty, how did you get the next round of of customers for a Healthy Surprise? Ooh, wow. Um, you know, it was. I would say mostly like bloggers. Really, um, it was kind of like the next wave of yeah. So, so one of the, the cool things about Startup Weekend was it, it gives you a little bit of a of a marketing boost. So we had some stories written about us, and it mm. was kind of like um, I got invited to go to like this thing called um, I think it's it was Launchpad. Jason Calacanis like does this startup thing every year. Yeah, I don't know, I know what that. you're talking about. It's like launch. It's like launch yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. And so we got, I got invited to go to that, you know, and I, I just kind of rode this little bit of, of a, of a wave and, um, you know, it just kind of kept going. So I would say the next, the next group was kind of like bloggers and, and yeah. they were interested and we would send them boxes and then they would review it. We would get, you know, 10 people would sign up, five people, 20, you know, and kind of got to that next degree of magnitude. So if you go from like 30 right. to 300, 
that's where subscription boxes kind of the wheat separates from the, the chaff. Um, you know, you kind of get this kind of like thing where you're really not making a lot of money. 300 boxes times, you know, $30 is what, you know, a few thousand bucks. Um, that's not enough to pay rent in Los Angeles or pay people a salary right. or, you know, have to and you have all the expenses, you have the actual products and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So you're making almost nothing, but if you got to, if you got to hand write out 300 addresses and put them on boxes and pack 300 boxes and bring it into the right. post office, that's, that's a lot of effort to do that. I mean, if you can just kind of imagine and you know, just the stairs you get at the post office and people looking at you as you're, as you're, Unloading your hundreds of. Did boxes. you actually bring them to the post office? Those three hundred boxes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And we still we still bring orders to the post office. We now now we're in a position where I, we have a daily pickup, so the postman comes every day, right. and it's beautiful. But you know, still, if it's like, for example, our pickup is like at eleven a.m. or something, so we have a, a policy where if you place an order by like nine a.m., we guarantee it'll get in the mail that same day. But if it is, let's say, uh, for example, on the holidays, like Christmas, um, it's crazy. You know, like that, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's like, it's like December 20th or whatever is like the last day to put it in the mail to get it to the, so it'll get there by Christmas day or Christmas Eve. So what we'll do on like that kind of situation is that the mailman will come pick up a lot of orders at 11 AM and then anything that comes in the rest of the day, we'll take down to the post office just so we can give that extra level of service. Yeah. At what point do you hire your first person that you're like, I cannot do this on my own? As soon as you think I can't do this on my own, and, and you got the money to I do mean, it, I mean, you, you personally, like oh, when did I hire somebody? Yeah. Okay, I know very specifically. This is this was very clear to me. I was working at, I did the startup weekend. I was working at Coloft, and I was up late. And one of the things um, I did was I installed this little chat box on the on the page, and it would let people that were on the page chat with me, and it would tell me where they were in the world, like their IP address, and a couple other things. And at like three in the morning, some guy came on from Abu Dhabi, it said, United Arab Emirates. And I said, this is crazy. So anyways, this guy ends up ordering our most expensive box, which is $99 at the time. Mm. And I chatted with him and, you know, uh, he was whatever. And I, when I got off of that, he found us just through like a blog article. And I realized like the internet – was real like this magic of like you could just build this business and someone could just come and buy stuff. I mean this guy was literally as far away around the globe as you could be right. and I was like okay, I got a real thing here. You know cuz we, we did we did the startup weekend uh, and you know a couple thousand dollars in sales like that's great, but that's not you know that's not a real you don't know you have like a real business. I mean, I was at You're this still event testing it. Yeah. Signing, you know, I wasn't like but now I had this random guy from, you know, 12,000 miles away right. bought my most expensive product and the website kind of sucked. I mean, it really wasn't impressive back then. Like we had all stock photography and it was, just, you know, we, it was kind of thrown together in a weekend. I mean, it wasn't the worst, but it really wasn't like, you know, if you go there now, it looks great. We have all professional photos. So that was the moment when I decided to hire someone because mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I got this business here. It's going to be a real thing and I can't do it on my own. Yeah. And so when did you graduate from just after hours co-loft to a separate place where you actually needed to rent out? Well, so it came in stages. I ended up renting out my friend's one car detached garage for $40 a month. And I installed some like rack shelving on both sides of it. All right. um, so you could basically walk in and spin around and grab snacks on both sides. And uh, I did that for you know, months and months until physics caught up to us and we just literally couldn't fit any more boxes. You know, these boxes aren't, aren't, aren't kind of, you know, they're not small, but they're, they're pretty big. Yeah. And, um, and then I ended up going home to Florida and I remember, I don't remember exactly what was happening. I think I was applying to Y Combinator. I was just kind of thinking about business and what I was doing. Yeah. Cause you're bootstrapping this. Yeah. I was self-funded the whole thing. Yeah. And I said to myself, I said, what am I doing? Am I just doing this to like do it out of my friend's garage or like am I doing this because like this is what I'm doing right now. Hell yeah. Let's go for it. This is my life. Right. I want to make this work. 
And I realized, well, what, what's the point of half-assing it? I mean, like, if you're going to do it, do it. And um, that's when I decided to go big. Mm-hmm. And, like, the next day I, I flew back to L.A. And um, I ended up looking for a new property. And that's where I found, like, about a 3,500-square-foot loft in, um, in L.A. where we moved into it. And at the time, it was huge because I had this little, like, you know, 40-square-foot you know, parking space that we were working in. And then now all of a sudden we had this like almost 4,000 square Huge. feet. Huge. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes you, you can expand in, you know, the, what's the expression? Like work expands into the time allotted for it. Well, you know, sometimes I guess a business can expand into the space right. given. To it, so it's like Parkinson's law or something like that. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So we moved in and then within a couple of years it was, it wasn't big enough. Really? So yeah. what was the growth? So it went from the startup weekend to the blogging to what was the next major? Because you're managing so many different pieces here, managing inventory, shipping, products coming in from companies. And then on top of that, you actually have to get customers, right? So what was the next biggest wave of, of customers after the blogging? Uh, oh. I started doing um, like daily deal kind of promotions like hmm. flash sales were really big back then that was really kind of um happening i remember i did this one for a company i don't even know if they exist anymore it was called plum district hmm. and I've, uh, I've heard i've heard of it i've seen it yeah yeah and i think we did like like twenty thousand dollars in hmm. signups with a coupon so you know it wasn't like the twenty thousand was like the full retail amount we might have had like a right. discount on it maybe been like forty thousand possibly yeah yeah, exactly. So it was like it was like it was like you know this huge amount of signups, um, and we added like this huge amount of, uh, of customers, um, and so that was kind of like like the next there's different there's different kind of phases of it, um, trying to figure out h- how to do it and how to get people, um, and so yeah, we I kind of think I moved into kind of that daily deal blogger kind of mode, and that's when um, we really peaked and we got the biggest and we added in you know more people yeah what what's been the biggest challenge with that business would you say running out of money is a big challenge um what do you mean by that well the subscription business that is is a big challenge (laughs) yes i agree And, and, and one thing my father taught me is that as the ceo or the boss or whatever you want to call it your number one job is to not run out of money Hmm. like whatever else you have going on it doesn't really matter because if you run out of money, it's all over because right. I've seen it. Like you can you can not pay vendors and you can like not pay rent and you might get like, you know, a couple months before you get evicted and like you got some some wiggle room. But if you don't pay your people, after like one or two payrolls, like nobody's everybody's out. You know what I mean? So literally once you run out of money, the whole thing shuts down. Even if you can get money later, I mean once people leave you, it, it's over. So uh, we never ran out of money. Um, but one of the when I was self funding um, healthy surprise, I you know I realized that it doesn't work at three hundred customers. We talked about that, right? right. It's not enough people. Yeah. So you really kind of like have to scale it to the certain point where it makes sense. It's economical, and, yeah. Because then you could yeah. buy the the stuff economically, and and the metrics work out better. Yeah, and you can afford to pay someone like to come in and manage all the boxes and the customer service and, and do all this kind of stuff at scale yeah. and pay your rent and all these things. So I was pouring my own cash into the business to subsidize uh, the advertising to, to scale it up. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about it. It still makes sense today. Um, but I ran into some problems um, that maybe your listeners can learn from. And the first one, which wasn't the most apparent problem at the time, but I can't stress this enough, was that I didn't charge enough money. Yeah. And I was going to ask up, early on, how would you figure out your pricing? Yeah. So I, I marked it up based off of what I thought was like uh, – like if you go to Best Buy and you buy a TV for $100, they probably paid 60 So right. that's kind of like a standard like discount on a lot of stuff. It's a discount uh, on in in construction fixtures, which was kind of like my history. So if you, someone buys a toilet, right. same kind of model. Right. So I thought that kind of markup system would 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 extend over to what I was doing, um, which is not enough. 
And in fact, uh, with my current portfolio of brands, yeah. we don't come to market if we don't have a 5x multiple on the cost of goods. So mm. if you want to compare this, um, if, mm. we're, if we're going to set, if, if, if we want to sell a widget for $10, it can't cost us any more than two to make. Right. Whereas with this model, if I was going to sell my healthy surprise box for ten dollars, it'd be costing me six. Um, so that's a tremendous difference. Yeah. And at the time, if someone had told me that you needed to mark up your boxes five x from what you're paying, yeah. one I would have said what most people say, like that's too much, and I'm ripping people off or whatever, which really is founded in, in naivete because a Coke. Coca-Cola is costing you 100x markup, and that's what you need to be it's in business. It costs a couple cents for them to make yeah, it, yeah. I mean, I can go, do a whole diatribe on that, but that was one of the main things was yeah. I didn't charge enough. And part of that was because you can't charge 5x on healthy food. Groceries have a very low margin, and people have been conditioned by going to their grocery stores for their whole lives right. that they, they don't pay a huge amount of money for food. Like Food is not one of the things you pay a big yeah. premium on for a right. lot of people. Right. Whereas people want to buy expensive cars and expensive colleges right. for their kids, they don't want to buy expensive potato chips. Right. At least they didn't, you know, five years right. ago when I started it. Yeah. No, I agree. It's like if you buy like a kombucha, right? That's like four dollars. You can get like an entire value meal, like McDonald's, for like the same yeah. exact price. Exactly. Yeah. So, so there's that piece about it, and the charging more, and and I, I, I if people take one thing away from this, if you're if you're selling something and you make it. Charge a lot for it, at least five times, hopefully up to 10x or more. Right. Um, and then the other thing, so that was my mistake, and that was something that I could control a little bit. Yeah. In as much as that I could have charged more, but but at the time, it's hard to charge for food, but whatever. Yeah. Then the other thing that I ran into that I, I couldn't really control so much was that, um, you know, I kind of started this category, the subscription snack right. food category, which was kind of cool, and other people took notice. And um, I ended up having a bunch of people copy the idea, hmm. which is great and it's fine. And I even had some people like copy our website where like they copy the actual text. Really? You know, like, their description. So, like my name's Joe Winky. I'm the founder. Yeah. <laughs> they literally copy like word for word. I have screenshots. I, I, you know, what is it, my ego? But I have like a little folder on my computer of like screenshots of, of businesses that like, you know, at the time were copying me. I just couldn't believe it. It was, it was so like – flattering and kind of gross like simultaneously right. and emotions so there was a bunch of people that copied me and that wasn't the problem the problem was is that they went and raised a lot of capital from it hmm. and that was something i didn't do because hmm. i read this book the four-hour work week and my goal was to have this cash flow business not to build this giant snack empire and i always let that be my guidepost i always wanted I, that was the reason i was doing this it wasn't for the money to become a huge rich venture capitalist guy hmm. But there were people that, that did do this, and some of these companies raised, um, you know, NatureBox, uh, who's still around. I think they raised like twenty nine million dollars. Wow! And that's an abstract number for even me five years ago. Now that I've you know run some businesses and we're doing some big revenues, like to spend to, when you raise money, you don't raise it to put it in the bank and get interest on it. You raise it to spend it to make mm. shit happen, and. The way that this bought, this business works is that if you're raising, say, $30 million, usually the, the VCs don't just come and say, here's your $30 million, like, let us know how it goes. They say, like, okay, here's half a million, and you're at you know, 300 users right now, but when you get to 1,000 users, we'll release another million to you. And then when you get to like 5,000 users, we'll give you a 5 million. Right. And they, right. this is called tranches, and they'll like kind of re release it. Well, the way that these guys set up these deals was that they weren't looking at the, the bottom line profit or loss of for the business because that metric really isn't very important when you're trying to do this like massive, you know, unicorn type startup. So they incentivized the management team at these other snack food businesses to just increase the number of subscribers. They just want growth. That's, they wanted growth. They wanted mm -hmm. more and more boxes shipped. So what happened was these other companies started giving these very big incentives mm. to sign up. And at the peak, my favorite anecdote about this yeah. was yeah. that I signed on to Facebook and ConsciousBox, which is my friend Jameson, he started it. Um, you know, he started it, whatever. He did, he's not there now anymore. But 
they I got an ad on Facebook that said three months free if you sign up. And, and then you start buying the boxes and putting their stuff in I, your stuff. <laughs> like, Get all your employees to sign up and then you just put their stuff in your boxes. No. <laughs> well, because you can never – I mean – That's and I crazy. Can go into all yeah. the economics of it and blah, blah, blah and whatever, the recycle and the you know LTV of the customer and all this stuff. But there's like almost no way to ever make, mo- make money on that customer yeah. because you got to also pay for all the people who are just signing up and quitting after the three months – and and that's such a good deal. You're gonna get a lot of those people. So like the people that stay with you are never gonna really pay that back. Right. So I called up the guy because I had, I had been seeing you know half a month off. You know even we the most we ever did was like a fifty percent off your first month, which yeah. which still is super generous. But when you're comparing that to like a free month, two free months, three right. free months, it's like so much that I called up the guy and I was like, man, I'm like, what are you doing with three months for free? And he's like, oh. I didn't even know they were doing that, like the marketing team, because I don't know. He claimed he was disconnected from it. But at the end of the day, like for better or for worse. So did they have an answer for you about that? What about why they were doing it? Yeah, it was it just because they had so much money in the bank they could just afford to. to yeah, do that? because what else are they spending the money on? Yeah. I mean, I mean that's the thing. Like you can pay yourself a great salary, but but the whole goal is just to sign up more people. And you know it's it's an addictive it's an addictive drug. Like if you give out a fifty per, you know fifty percent discount and you're like oh you know the conversion rate on the on the landing page is like seven percent when we do that. Well, let's increase it. What happens if we give a free month? Oh, it goes up to eleven percent. Oh, and they you know they, it's like the slippery slope. Right. And they have so much cash. So, anyways, these guys just threw a huge amount of money, and what that did is they devalued their own product. Because when you give something to someone for free, what's the value of it? It's zero because it's free. Well, what happens if you give someone three months of it for free? Well, you, they basically trained anyone that was interested in a subscription snack box yeah. that you should get it for free for three yeah. months. Right. So, so then you go to my website where I'm bootstrapping this thing, and I, I only, you know, I had, like I said, I had some money, but compared to these, you know, thirty million dollars, like right. it's like. It's like I'm in this little, you know, like little twenty foot sailboat, and I'm I'm going by like the USS Nimitz class, like you know, aircraft carrier. I mean, it was just I, I was like this little thing, and and they had you know these massive guns, yeah. and I'm like shit. How can I beat them? Well, right. it's hard to beat. You know, it's hard it's hard to compete with someone that is that well capitalized. So um, I pivoted the business a little bit. And, um, you know, we're still here and we're, we're still around, but to answer your question about what was really tough, what was tough was that it took me a while to realize what was going on. And like I told you, I was burning money to get to that critical mass where we could at least like right. break even and make money. Right. But I was doing that simultaneously to these other people that were pouring so much money. in. so, so I overspent and, um, I never ran out of money. Like I told you that was the dictum. But I mean, there was a time when um, I mean I couldn't pay my bills, and I I was always able to pay the team, and people took pay cuts. Um, but I mean, there was vendors I couldn't pay, yeah. and yeah. it was very humbling, and it was it was a great teacher to have to like get on the phone with somebody who you know we've been ordering stuff and stuff and stuff, and say, look, you know, my bad here, like I, I misjudged, and 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 I can't mm. pay you, and I want to pay you, yeah. and I'm gonna pay you. But right now I can't, and um, yeah. Yeah. we ended up paying everybody, and it, we made it through. But uh, you know that was a really that was a really big learning experience. So it was just being as transparent as possible with the vendors to tell them kind of the situation. Yeah, but I mean I think that advice works with everything in life. You yeah. know, I mean I mean the truth really will set you free, and I wasn't trying to screw anybody. Right, and. Um, you know, I kind of told them. I mean, I, I created payment plans with people, and I said, "Look, I may owe you a thousand bucks. You know, I'll pay you a hundred. Yeah. I'll try to pay, pay a hundred every every you know um, every month until we can pay it down." Uh, but yeah, I mean, being, being transparent with people, and I mean, I had an advantage that that people were also getting a, a very good promotional value by participating with us. Yeah, that was actually something that we we always did differently, and we still do differently than than a lot of these guys. Is that they would just kind of solicit vendors for free product and they'd say, hey, can you donate some stuff? Well, when you do that, one, you're not in control of what you get 
and two, you're usually getting the worst stuff because it's like, oh, this stuff's going to expire next month. Like, give it to the subscription box people. I always remember I started this based off of a quality thing. Right. I always wanted to maintain the quality, so we always bought the product from our vendors. You know, we'd say, hey, you got to give us a good price right. because you're going to get a marketing benefit. And look at you know, right. Nature Box. Nature Box doesn't do this, but like Conscious Box wants it for free. So you know, it wasn't so bad. But yeah, if you get into a tough situation, I mean, I mean, you got to be honest with your vendors, and you also have to be honest with yourself. That's one of the biggest problems people have is that they'll lie to themselves about what they're doing and their ability to pay. So if you can just keep it real, I mean, it is what it is, right? So what was your magic number at the time that you wanted to get to that you knew you could have economies of scale? Oh, in terms of like subscribers? Yeah. How many did you want to get to? Oh, I mean, I mean, I wanted to get to, you know, a million. Um, right, but when you're saying the vendors, I got to get this payment plan, there's probably a number you're like, okay, if I could just get to a thousand subscribers, I could actually pay my vendors or whatever the case is. Well, when that, when that occurred, we weren't growing anymore. So, so the business really, it really, it, it, it accelerated. Like we started off, you know, we had the startup weekend thing. I kind of rode that momentum and then I got into the, the, the deals where we were able to get more and more people um, and then as that was kind of happening, the other people came into the space and it kind of got oversaturated yeah. and, um, and then we kind of peaked and then we kind of were, were kind of coming back down to earth. And that was when the kind of financial stuff occurred. When you're growing, it's, you know, it's exciting and you're adding more people on. Um, and usually you can pay more things. So that was kind of it. Um, but in terms of like what, what the broke even number would have been, I mean, back then, I don't remember, but. You know, in the thousands of subscribers, you know, ten thousand yeah. subscribers or whatever would would have done it. Uh, one of the big things, though, that was a shift from that lesson, and this is why, when you, if you have a tough lesson, you know, something bad bad happens in business, and like, oh, I can't pay the bills. That's just feedback from the universe telling you, like, look, your plan is askew. You know what I mean? Like, it's not working yeah. because when it is working and it flows like the money comes and the people come and the attention comes and I get on the inspired insider podcast this you know, is and it's the pinnacle working. yes right <laughs> I, it's like like um, hopefully <laughs> but uh you know when it's not working like it becomes very clear you, you can't pay the bills and you have these difficult conversations so you got to figure it out right. so one of the things is we um we shifted our business model a little bit we shifted our pricing model I raised the prices um and so to this day uh, we're definitely not, you know, the biggest company out there in, in this space, um, but we're profitable and we've got a great, you know, sustainable business. We we pay all of our vendors for the product, so I don't feel like I'm, you know, taking anything from anybody for yeah. free. And uh, we have a really high level of service, and we provide a fantastic yeah. product. So, um, you know, that's kind of the end of the day. What, what was more important to me uh, than just being the biggest? Yeah. So, Joe, you said you pivoted, and obviously you changed the pricing. What else? was uh, like a, a pivot that you had to yeah. do at the time. So it wasn't like a major, you know, giant thing, but I really realigned from being a subscription business yeah. to being into the gifting business. Hmm. Because I noticed that a lot of people were sending the boxes to people as gifts. Yeah. And um, if you think about the psychology of it, and this is where like high level marketing really takes place, is that you have to think about you know the value that people have for things in their brains um, in different buckets. So, for example, grocery. And we talked about this a little bit early. Yeah. People yeah. don't pay a lot for grocery. Like they want to, if they're looking at the shelf and there's, you know, there's canned soup for one dollar and there's canned soup for ninety cents. They're like, I'll buy the ninety cent one because it's it's canned soup. Right. But if you're sending your girlfriend a Valentine's Day gift. You might want to buy the more expensive can of soup because you want her to be get the best one and not know that she. Oh man, my guy like mm. cheaped out for mm. ten cents. He got me the shitty soup. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so when people are buying gifts, they tend to think about it differently, and they're yeah. willing to pay more. And in fact, gifts kind of align around different price points. Like there's people that want to spend fifty dollars on a gift, and you can send like yeah. basically like a dozen roses to anybody in the country for fifty dollars, and that's like great. And then there's like a hundred dollar price point. So these different kind of price points where people will, right. will value yeah. a gift. Yeah. Um, and I realized that our our product, you know, where all these other guys were just trying to make the cheapest thing in three months and just throw some free shit in there. Yeah. 
Yeah. I said, okay, well, I'm going to do the opposite of that. Kind of like where, where the dirt and I wanted to do the opposite of right. that. I said, okay, everybody else is racing to the bottom. How cheap can they make their box? I said, I want to make the best one. I want to make one that when you open it up, it's beautiful and it's like yeah. a, it's yeah. like a, it's a present and there's a beautiful card in there and there's a gift card and a sticker and it's, you know, full color. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I did is we kind of like, yeah. we kind of pivoted towards uh, increasing the value of the box, increasing the price. Emphasizing on service, so like I told you, if, if an order comes in at 9 a.m., it's in the mail that day. Every single package we mail it goes out USPS priority mail, so it usually gets there in one or two days. Um, and if it, you know, we'll take the box. If someone calls in and says, "Hey, I need to get this there tomorrow," we'll take it to the post office. So I made us more into a service business than a commodity yeah. snack business, yeah. which yeah. is what the other people are competing with. And we found our niche. Yeah, I love it. I'm going to be a customer for sure because I love healthy foods. And um, who have been some, at what point do vendors start reaching out to you? Because I see a lot, again, like a lot of subscription companies will ask for free product and things like that. So I can see definitely a premium if you're actually paying. Vendors will be attracted to you not only for, they're getting exposure, great exposure to these customers who are paying, but you're actually paying them, right? So what point does word get out? And you start getting an influx of these vendors wanting to work with you. Eventually, I mean, I, I don't know. Has when that it, happened yet, or no? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we get a torrent of inbound uh, vendor requests. Great word. We yeah. get we get like two or three people a day that want to review the box. So that, hey, send me one, and I'll review it. On of YouTube. course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like we now have a whole like we have a whole application process to like weed people out that are applying for this kind of yeah. stuff. But it, you know, it, it it occurs where it's like it's like little blips, yeah. you know, one one a week, yeah. and then all of a sudden the blips yeah. become a lot. So what yeah, vendors, get, I guess, came on board that you're like, wow, like they, this vendor is reaching out to us. Maybe it's one that you loved or you'd heard of. Who are some of your favorite vendors in that in that sense? Um, I really like the guys, at, the the gals. It's, it's I think it's all woman team at Hail Mary. Hmm. Um, they make really wonderful. Raw chocolates hmm. and, and uh, macaroons. All their stuff is really high quality. I mean, they really care, and the stuff's great. And um, I remember kind of like the first time I saw it, it was like the premium healthy snack, and it was kind of indulgent. Right. And then when they kind of came on board and they, they were really excited to work with us, that was a little bit of like a you know like a hero moment for me in the sense yeah. that I was like, oh wow, this is cool. Like I, you know, this brand is cool, and now I'm. Um, now I'm, I'm meeting with them, and I've had a lot of those experiences yeah. Uh, yeah. where you know you're kind of like working, and then all of a sudden you're someone or someone you really respect kind of comes into your life in a cool way, right. and that's right. one of the cool things about business and, and, and work is that you can manifest those experiences. Yeah, how do you get feedback from customers in that sense? Like, let's say Joe, like we love this hail mary, like you need to include it again, mm-hmm. or. You know, I could do without this other snack that was in there. It was okay, but um, well, we solicit every customer uh, for a review for them to review the boxes. Yeah. Um, what's a big surprise? I guess feedback that you got that surprised you from customer. I mean, I've heard so many people tell me things about the food and what they like and what they don't like that, that I'm almost not surprised anymore. It's mm-hmm. kind of like, I know it's, it's a non-answer answer, but I've, I've heard so many like contradictory things, you know, where, where in one month we'll send the same product out to like person A and person B and person A will call in and tell me it's the greatest thing they've ever put in their mouth. And person B will tell me they wouldn't feed it to like a sick <laughs> dog starving, you know, on a mountain cliff. and you're just kind of like, okay, well, what do you I do guess with that? Yeah. Any customers, you know, I gotta gotta go with my gut. So yeah. no, I mean if we get you know real persistent feedback, we can kind of see a trend. Um, we'll try to lock onto that. But then you also gotta be aware that that sometimes if, if you're seeing a trend of feedback, you know you're kind of like getting a self selection in the people that are telling you the the, the issue. You know, so if, for example, people you know people say, hey, I hate this product because it has peanuts in it, it makes me sick. Well, maybe you're just getting people with peanut allergies, you know, and it really is like an awesome product, but just this one percent of the people are the right. ones that are vocal. So right. you kind of have to take it, take it in stride. Yeah, you know, take it in perspective. Yeah. So, why do you think you survived? 
Because there was a lot of companies that probably had a lot of funding that didn't. Yeah, we ended up acquiring um, really know, maybe like four or five of the other subscription boxes. Yeah, we've rolled them in. Um, why did we survive? Because uh, it's like I picture that dinghy, that visual you said, when this huge navy ship going by you. <laughs> you know. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, man, when it comes down to it, it's like business is just a series of, of setbacks, like that. And life is a series of setbacks where you keep uh, getting knocked down, and there's new challenges. And like, can you can you get up and, and get up and get up and get up? And I was able to get up uh, repeatedly for my own kind of fortitude and my own ability to have some resources. And then when we ran out of resources, to get scrappy and figure out how to make it work. And um, and the pivot worked, you know, like by changing the business model and changing the pricing and getting that dialed in. Uh, and being able to dial in, you know, getting very, very efficient with the shipping costs mm-hmm. and like just being really smart about it. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, it was a combination of like, oh, I'm so smart, you know, whatever. And also that we just did it for a long time and we kind of got really good at it. So there's a lot of intellectual property and hours put into like, for example, we, I had, um, we have Two main sizes of the boxes. Let's call it small and yeah. large. Yeah. And, well, you talk about it. You have the classic box subscription, then you have the big box subscription, right? Yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll get you on the marketing team next. The, the marketing team will get mad at me for calling it small. Yeah, we got the classic. And then box we and have the big, paleo box and, and and the paleo box. Yeah. So the so the classic box and the big box are two different physical size boxes that we mail out, mm-hmm. and um, I had them custom made and they're beautiful and we designed them and they look great or whatever. But what? So if you got it, you'd be like, "Oh, this is a nice, healthy surprise box, and this is a nice one too." But what you wouldn't realize is that the classic box is 1.99 cubic feet, like in volume, and the big box is 2.99 cubic feet in volume. And that no one probably knows this, but the post office they have like a kind of like a hidden um, uh, level of service called cubic. Pricing. Okay. And typically, uh, packages are, sh- are shipped in there. You pay by the weight. I love the level of detail here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the answer to your question. Yeah, no, I love this. Yeah. We figured out all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, we, and we're really good at it. So um, shipping is like one of the one of the biggest line items. So you got to have this dialed in. Right. So, for example, uh, the cubic rate isn't available to people unless you're doing over $10,000 a month in shipping. It's a huge amount of shipping. Mm. Um, but and we weren't doing that at the time when I figured this out. But I was like, holy smoke, I got to figure this out because, because what, you, what you realize is if you're sm- sending small, heavy things, this shipping um, rate is way, way, way better than doing it by the pound. Like almost 50% off in, in certain instances if you have the right combination of stuff. That's amazing. Well, it, worked, yeah. it worked really well for us. So I was able to design our boxes and like all of our processes – Around things like that, where we were able to save, you know, like four dollars on every shipment, yeah. which you know, to someone else, to like yeah. when you're selling other- thousands of boxes, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, well, that's whether you're in business or not. Yeah, yeah. So, talk about some of the products people should check out for a second. You have the classic box, big box subscription, paleo box. You know, you talked about pivoting with the gift, the gifting, right? So one day you could say, okay, we're going to focus on gifting. Uh, what does that mean? Do you change messaging on the site? Do you do certain promotions? How do you shift that thinking from the grocery mindset to the gifting mindset? Okay, so a lot of things. Uh, one of them is, is changing the weight of the messaging on the, on the website, of course. Mm-hmm. So if you go there, instead of saying, well, subscribe, 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 you know, maybe you say, hey, Valentine's Day is coming up. Mm. And you can kind of shift that messaging. Um, that's one of the big ways you do it. Uh, of course, if you're advertising is, is one way you do it. Um, what I think was my cl- most clever anecdote in this yes. story is that what I, I realized is I said, okay, who's the best customer to send a healthy surprise gift to it? And I said, well, it's actually someone who's received a healthy surprise gift. Because if you've received it, hmm. that means that one of my uh, one of my customers has qualified you as being a person that would like 
the, the, the service, right? Like basically, right. like for example, if you sent a gift out to somebody, I don't know how many people you know, but you're a popular guy. You might know 10,000 people. You've gone and said, oh, of all my 10,000 people I know, you know, Sally Sue would really like this. Mm. So now Sally Sue is like, is like of all the people in the world, she's a pretty good contender to be a customer for Healthy Surprise as opposed to like the random person that might click on a Google ad. Right. So I said to myself, okay, how am I going to get Sally Sue to buy for my, for my business? Because she's going to get the box and she's probably going to think, wow, this is great. And then she's going to go on with her life. So I had the idea that I was going to print out like not just a little coupon, but I wanted like a gift card. Like if you go to like Home Depot and you get the gift card or like, you know, sort of more in stake, a Visa gift card. I went and had gift cards made with like mm. beautiful photography uh, in, in, for different amounts. And I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put a $25 gift card that can only be used for another gift in every outbound gift. Wow. So now every person that gets one of our healthy surprise boxes as a gift, they get it and they get the gift note. Hey, you know, you're awesome. Happy birthday. Love that idea. Yeah. They also get a gift card in it. So it's, it's a benefit to the sender. Because now the sender's gift has increased by $25 in value. Because not mm. only do you get the box of snacks, but now you also get a gift card. Yeah. And now the recipient has this gift card and they're like, oh, wow, like $25. Like, let me go see what I can do with this. Right. So that kind of created this kind of like viral. Yeah. I like that. That's smart because I don't want to get a, maybe if I'm getting a gift for someone, I don't want it to be just one month, right? If I'm getting it for myself, maybe I'll be like, oh, I'll just try it for a month. But if I'm getting it for someone else, I want to be like, oh, I'll get them three months and let them try it or whatever the case is. So, yeah, I like that. And we, and we have multi-month gifts people can send on, the, on right. the website. So do you have a discount? I'm just asking for myself right now. If I buy a year in advance yeah, of boxes, yeah. mm -hmm. you do? Yeah. So um, really we would handle that as like if you bought like a 12-month gift. Mm. So uh, I, I think it's about 15% off if you do okay. that. All right. Cool. Um, so back to your story for a second, Joe. Um, so, you know, we talked a lot about the, you know, the customer growth and, you know, some of the challenges and with, with healthy surprise, when does Jumbo superfoods or anything else on healthy surprise that you think would be important to mention? Um, cause I could talk for probably 10 more hours about healthy yeah. surprise, but I'm going to cut myself off. I would just say yeah. charge more if yeah. you're not more. Make sure you have the multiple. It was the biggest lesson I learned was that and that and my subsequent companies incorporated this tremendously, yeah. but you have to have the margin and you have to have enough margin and fat in your sales price right. that you can you can grease all the different hands that are gonna come out that wanna get a piece of it. So for example, uh, with with the dirt, um, you know, we're now in talks to, to get picked up by Whole Foods. Yeah, and they're working on this, and it's like a year-long process of getting everything dialed in for them. And um, you know, with with Whole Foods, you know, Whole Foods is going to want to make their margin on it, and then they're going to want to buy it from a distributor, and the distributor is going to want to get a piece of it too. Right. And then I also have my sales guy who like yeah. set up the deal, and he's going to want to get a piece of it. But your and five times rule becomes a little more difficult when it comes to that, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, here's yeah. the here's here's the math on it. Let's say that we're going to sell a widget at retail. Okay, great. Well, it's going to sell for $10. Well, the retailer wants to double their money right off the bat. So now they're going to go $5. So now I'm going to only sell it to, the, to them for $5. So, wow. Right. From 10 now we're at 5 Okay, great. Well, there's going to be a distributor involved. There's where they're going to get it from. The distributor wants like 25% of it. Okay. Yeah. Of the $5, they're going to want $1.25. Ooh, now we're down to $3.75. I get a sales guy. He's going to want to get 20% of it of the wholesale price. So that's that's 20% of 5. That's 1. Now we're down to 275. Well, it cost me $2 to make it. I'm only making up 75 cents on this big $10 thing, right? Yeah. So like that's the mentality you have to right. have as an entrepreneur is to understand like, oh shit, it sounds like this big multiple. But really like at the end of the day, you're just left with a little bit. Yeah. So if you only are doubling your price and you do this little math equation we just did, you're going to see that you're either going to end up with pennies you're going to be in the black, right, right. in the red. Right. So what kind of – you said, okay, so you went from the co-loft to the garage to the 3,500. Where are you at now? What What kind of space do you work out of for Healthy Surprise now? 
Um, well, healthy. Oh, that's that's a that's a complicated question. We we eventually ended up moving our assembly and fulfillment to a fulfillment center. Uh, they call it a three PL. Yeah, so, yeah, three PL. Yeah, yeah. So we ended up. Um, I, I moved that all out mm. of the office. Because remember, the whole go- the whole goal that I started with was to have this autonomous business, yeah. so I could be on a beach, like in this yeah. in this book. Um, so, so you could ship what- everything to three PL, and they could help handle the the yeah, delivery and inventory. I ended up partnering with a company that it started off great. Um, it's ended up being a rocky relationship with them, but the but eventually we got to the point where literally we could order all the product. It would be received at this facility. They would break it down. They would assemble the boxes, yeah. put them on the shelf, and then ship them out. And so I just had this. I just had this software, you know, that's running on a server, and uh, I had my programmers develop, you know, working through the API. And yeah. the orders come in, and the boxes go out, and that's it. And it just runs. So we eventually got to the point where we trans. We literally went from needing this huge facility to not needing a facility at all. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So. Jumbo Superfoods. Mm-hmm. When let, me, you, let me let me just touch on the dirt real quick. Yeah, go ahead. It was the original question, which I never answered, and it leads to Jumbo. So go ahead. Yeah, the toothpaste. The health, the health thing was healthy surprise, and I got into the kind of health and wellness. Right. And then I was doing the, the healthy surprise subscription, and it's all about the ingredients of the food, like what's going in your body. Sure. But once you start looking at every single label that you ever do anywhere, which has now become my life because that's what's the business, I started looking at like what's in my toothpaste, what's right. in my shampoo, right. what's in the soap, what's in the what's in the mouthwash, what's in all these right. creams and things I'm smearing on my body, you know? Because when you take a lotion and you like right. suntan lotion, go look at go whoever you're listening to this, pause this thing, go forget your toothpaste, go look what's in suntan lotion, and tell me if you know what any of that stuff is. Right. It's general it's, rules. If you can't pronounce it, it's probably not good for you. Yeah, yeah, how many Z's and V's are in it, you know? like, right. And it's killing all the, the coral reefs, but whatever. So there's just so much weird stuff in all of these products. And you, yeah. when you take some lotion and you just smear it on your body, like eventually it's just gone, right? Yeah. Well, where did it go? It's going into you. It absorbs, yeah. And, you know, you could say like all the weird illnesses we're having now with, you know, all these different disorders and autism and stuff. Maybe that's related to all these weird chemicals people are putting into their bodies. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I just knew that, like, wow, it's really weird that there's just all this crap and all these different things that I'm like putting into my body. And I, I got the food thing kind of figured out, right. but looking at what's in my toothpaste, what's in my deodorant, like, and then you start knowing, okay, well, well wait a minute, this is in my toothpaste, and this is like a known toxin to humans. Yeah. Why am I doing that? Like, couldn't we do it, make a toothpaste that doesn't have like the toxin in it? And I looked around, and like there really wasn't anything that was yeah. really performing at the with the level that I, I thought it, it, sh- yeah. it should. So that's how the dirt started. Um, was kind of that mentality of like, wow, like what's going on with our products? So so now we have a great line of personal care products. Uh, oral care is really our focus, and our um, MCT oil toothpaste is is really good. I recommend it to anybody. We have a hundred percent money back guarantee. Uh, I think that's on the website. If it's not there and you don't like it, email in and say, Joe said there was a guarantee from the podcast and we'll send you your money back for, sh- for sure. Um, but I highly recommend it because... So what kind of stuff is in it, Joe? What kind of stuff is in the toothpaste? Uh, well, it, the, the base is bentonite clay. So um, it's dirt in a way. Um, bentonite clay is actually really good for you. Um, a lot of people and animals eat it. It's uh, It uh, has... I want to get this right because I know on the internet everyone will fact check me, but it, it's <laughs> the, um, just the, Google it. Go on Wikipedia or something. There's figure. something about the ions of bentonite clay. Mm-hmm. Uh, it functions almost like soap in that it, it pulls toxins and they mm. bind to the bentonite clay. And that's why um, if you get sick, a lot of times they'll have you um, eat that. It can settle your stomach. Mm. So uh, bentonite clay um, and then different essential uh, essential oils. Um, and things that are, are beneficial to the um, to the mouth, yeah. And uh, the, the rose oil, the cacao, the mint for flavoring, um, and then MCT oil, which is medium chain triglyceride oil. It's yeah. They take, uh, I take oil. it. Yeah, I put it in smoothies. Yeah, 
Yeah, so they, they, I mean, it's like they, a stronger version of coconut oil, I guess I'd describe to people, right? Yeah, well, they take coconut oil, they spin it in a centrifuge, yeah. and the triglycerides, which are the fats, there's yeah. there's medium chain fats and there's long chain fats. They separate out yeah. and they take the medium chain ones. Um, so the product is completely natural. We use all natural ingredients that you can understand what they are, and um, you can eat it. I mean, it's it's you know it's actually good for you because the, the yeah. clay is good for you. Whereas if you're eating some of these other products, uh, there's plastic and antifreeze and all kinds of weird stuff in them. So how have you gotten traction selling? Like you said, you're in you're in um, contact with Whole Foods, and you're probably in. Um, I guess what's the biggest traction point? Is it through the website? Is it through um, yeah, well, physical we started, locations? We started completely on the web. Um, my my expertise was in selling on the web through Healthy Surprise and doing yeah. you know tens of thousands of orders. Uh, so then we did, we went on the web because that was, it just kind of plug and play. We plugged it into this, this logistical infrastructure we had built yeah. with all these surprise to fulfill and do the customer service. But then we started getting a lot of inbounds from grocery stores that were saying like, Hey, uh, you know, we want to carry your product. And then I was managing those deals because they were, I mean, really the highest level problem in the sense that no one on the team was doing that. And then it was like this new thing and it was money and revenue. So it came to me, and then uh, more came in, and then my partner started taking some of them, and then I realized I really wasn't doing a good job at, at servicing the accounts. I mean, we just—I was so busy with all the things going on, and now mm-hmm. I was managing this, and she wasn't doing that great. And we just said, "Well, wait a minute. Like the re- the wholesale business is growing with us like doing a bad job at it. Like, what would happen if we got an awesome person to like really focus on it? Right? You know." Light bulb, right? All right. So uh, we ended up um, bringing onto the team uh, my friend Kyle DeBonis, and he's been heading up um, that division, business development and, yeah. and wholesale accounts. And because he's now able to lean into it, focus into it, we just got picked up really um, for all Lassen's grocery stores through Southern California. Yeah. Uh, Whole Foods is wants it. We just got to like go through the you know the dance with them. Yeah. So now that's kind of expanding in a real cool way. Yeah. So. Is there a thought, what about dental offices? Is there a thought with, like, at any point, um, do you just go through the consumer or is there a thought of um, going to dentists or professionals like that? I ask because my, obviously, my dad and brother are both dentists, actually, and uh, yeah. they're very health conscious as well. Um, yeah. So I don't know if there's, how do you navigate that? Or do you not even worry about it and just worry about the... Or when you say go to them, I mean, like, to just go and say hi to them? Or yeah, go and say hi. Self? No, I don't know. Like, you know, because they're at the forefront of some of the like authority, I guess. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know if it means like an endorsement or authority or whatever. Like, I had one guy come on and he was basically helped grow Sonicare toothbrush in the avenues he did. Um, so I'm just curious if there's any of that component or is just focus on consumer. Well, we are focused on consumer. Um, we've, we do have dentists that endorse us yeah. and, um, so, you know, we've taken it to dentists and we have a lot of dentists that order it and love it and use it. The only thing I kind of thought about in terms of dentists is that I know when I usually go to different dentists and, and now that I moved across country, I got like a new dentist after having one my whole life in Florida and they pretty consistently want to give me small little like bottles of like Crest or Colgate or whatever whenever I leave. So that kind of like popped in my head as an opportunity to, to, to give samples out to the dentist to then give to their patients. Yeah. Um, the challenge with that has been that one, our product is so much more expensive than these other ones. And then two, you know, these are huge, massive conglomerates that are well capitalized. Uh, you know, we've been a bootstrap business and you got to have that margin because if you have a big margin, you can do stuff like that. That's how, we, again, another example of how these people are doing that. Right. Um, but it's just that's that's something that we haven't really focused on because, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, compared to getting into 300 locations through a distributor in the Northeast, you know, that's just a different scale than uh, a dentist. But mm-hmm. one day we'll get to it. Yeah. So toothpaste. I, call me. Your dad call me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so toothpaste. Um, anything else about the dirt uh, company that's interesting? Like yeah, product, think, like how do you expand? You expand to you have a bunch of products on there. You know, we have a you, bunch. Of, we had a bunch of new stuff coming out. We've got a, a fragrance line. We have two new flavors of the toothpaste 
um, coming out. We've how got do you a lip- decide? How do you decide? Okay, like not just focus on, like you said, the focus on the toothpaste. And how do you decide to come out with your next product? Because it's obviously a lot of time and, and resources. Well, product development, there's a lot of different elements to it. The yeah. things that pop to my, my mind is that one, for example, with, with the toothpaste, grocers typically want to have three flavors of something. So if you go in, into a, to a store, CVS, you'll notice there's usually you know mint, cinnamon, and you know natural flavor or whatever. So we realized that that was a, something we kind of needed to, to get into the, to the gate. So that's like a big part of, of product development is what does the market want? Right. Um, and then the other part is kind of like, for example, with um, Jumbo is a really good example, yep. is that yep. sometimes you just don't know. And you have an idea, and we'll bring a lot of products to market that are very, very similar to each other, and then see what buy, people buy, mm. and just kill our darlings. And Got it. Like, you know, we brought 20 SKUs to market, you know, one of them is working, or three of them are working, right. so the other 17 just go. And that's another thing that's hard for people to do, is they get invested in their, you know, they keep throwing good money after bad. Yeah. But much like I was able to walk away from the rocket ship and say, yeah. well, you know, Tough. I'm going to go... It's working. Tough decision. Yeah, yeah. You gotta just be on and that's the thing, you gotta be honest with yourself because if you are lying to yourself and thinking something's gonna work, like this is a, a something that's happened just real recently, like this realization was that even with healthy surprise, I felt like I was I was like having to really push and work to get it to go. And so much of my life seemed like that. But now with like the toothpaste because it's so it's so cool and sexy compared to regular toothpaste and different that it's just working yeah. and it's and the energy isn't like put into forcing it to yeah. happen. Yeah. It's to like corral and shape it where it That's just wants to occur. Yeah. And so sometimes like when you're really trying to like make something work that isn't working, until you have this other experience, like I, I can say this to people and they're not gonna viscerally understand it. I know what you mean, yeah. You can get one that just goes, and once you you're get like, that, why is this so easy compared to the yeah, last one? Yeah. Once you get a taste of that, you're like, yeah. wait a minute, why would I ever do anything that isn't this? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why would I, if I can make a new product, why would I keep working on the one that is like sucking all my money and energy away? Because right. it's possible to create things that just go. Now yeah. that's easy for me to say, you know, yeah, just create a product that everyone wants, and it's just going to like. Well, it out. goes into what you said, which is if you create 17 and you see two of them are flowing. Then it's easier for you to because you felt that energy of the, what if it's, it's more like a, a push instead of just like a constant working that you could kill those other ones easier you, you know in your mind you can kill them easier yeah if you can bring seven bring seventeen products to market is very hard to do right right <laughs> but yeah that's 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 the idea yeah I, okay let's say it's three or whatever it, you know it doesn't have to be seventeen but for yeah, someone or, it could be or pivot or you know evolve or like you know and that was earlier you, you said how did you do it and i was like well we got really good well the way you get really good is you got to just keep changing and moving and like so many times i'll mentor like entrepreneurs and they'll say oh i got this great idea and i'm gonna like do this business and we're gonna sell all these widgets but like i'm just like i'm just we're not done with a website I, oh Okay, well, what's what's wrong with the website? Well, my partner really thinks like the logo should be like aqua blue, but I'm set on turquoise, and like we just can't. We're at the stalemate, and you're just like, okay, that doesn't matter at all. Like you're not, you're getting, you're you're you letting this be a reason to not face the challenge, which might lead into failure. So yeah. people like will find a reason to, to not want to jump into the pool, or they might drown. Right. Um, and if you can just say, look. I'm just going to keep moving forward constantly, whether the logo is blue or turquoise or aquamarine, and I'm just going to go and just keep going forward. Eventually, you'll stumble on to some winners, yeah. some things that will go, and you'll have a great, a great business. Yeah, Joe, this is absolutely fantastic. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, I'm realizing it's getting late for you. It's uh, I can go on for hours, but um, I want you to talk a little about Jumbo Superfoods before we okay. – yeah. Before we uh, close up, uh, so because I know you said the toothpaste kind of leads a little bit to Jumbo Superfoods. Yeah. So once I kind of had this thing about okay, I got my my eating right, and then now I was kind of like taking care of my body. The next step for me was was the mind and the spirit. Yeah. And um, I started getting into yoga and meditation more. Yeah. I, I've had a practice for about over ten years, but being in LA, really, wow. Yeah, it's like the kind of the yoga central here 
uh, for a lot of people in, in the West Side. And um, I also got and started getting into cannabis. I mean, California has had 20 years of medical marijuana here. And uh, one of the key things about the medical marijuana program here is it allows you to get consistent stuff, or at the time stuff that was pretty consistent. So that allowed me to experiment and find out like, oh, well, maybe the reason that I'm like having this freak out bad experience where the floor is melting is I took too much. And maybe if I just take the perfect amount, it'll be a pleasant experience. And the floor I was is melting, that, right? Sometimes that's good. Um, so I, I was able to dial in to get to a really good spot. And I, I ended up stumbling into the fact that the cannabis and meditation or yoga or dance, uh, they're really very, very a wonderful combination and they fit really well. Yeah. One night I was at Peace Yoga in Los Angeles and I was very high and I did this very difficult long yoga class taught by Sherry Ray. It was like two or three hours. And in the end, she kind of like, she kicks your ass for two hours and has you fall into this deep Shavasana relaxation. That's like a meditation. And I went deep into it. And she, she goes upstairs and lets you lay there all night if you want. And I started doing this life evaluation. And I said, you know, how am I doing in my life? What are the behaviors that are serving me? What's hurting me? And I said, well, man, you're, you're taking a lot of cannabis. You know, like, is this good for you? Hmm. All, all the messaging is like, you know, you're a drug addict, you're bad. You're assessing yourself at that moment. Yeah, and, 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 and weed will do that to you. It makes you kind of question, you know, what are you doing? And then I, my next thought was like, well, you, you can't be that bad of a person because you just did three hours of yoga and now you're meditating about how you can <laughs> <now."> <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, okay, maybe, maybe the cannabis is working for me. And I said, actually, the cannabis is helping a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of myself. I'm being more spiritual. And then I thought about the way I was ingesting the cannabis and I was getting these little candies that you could like bite into like like little Jolly Rancher kind of sugar candies. And I was like, well, I'm the CEO of this health food company and I'm putting this like high fructose corn syrup in my, in my mm, body. I gotcha. I gotcha. So, so there's a mismatch there and it's not good for my teeth and it's just not sustainable. Like I wanted to use cannabis all the time, you know, not necessarily every day but, you know. Whenever you want it. Whatever I want, and I, 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 so I was like, okay, no problem. I'll just go to the marketplace and I'll just find something that's good for me. And so I went to the to the dispensary and I said, hey, do you have anything that is you know like a healthy edible? And they said, oh, we got it for you. Hold on, I'll get you this vegan brownie. And now I own a vegan company, a company that we sell vegan products. And I, as, you know, as he's bringing it, I'm thinking, okay, he doesn't get it because vegan is a philosophical decision. No harm to animals, really, at the end of the day. There are like correlated health benefits, but it's not like a causation thing. Like Coca-Cola is, is, is vegan. You know what I mean? Sugar is vegan. It's funny. I was just on the website today looking at what the certified vegan means. Mm. So, yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, there's uh, – I know exactly what you're saying. Vegan, okay? No one yeah. wants to say that, but it's true. And I love the vegan people. Uh, and I was vegan for a couple of years, so I, I've been there. Um, I get it. But so I was like, okay, that's not going to work. So he comes over and he says, oh, okay, here's this 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 brownie. It's vegan. And I said, okay, well that you're not getting it. So I tried to explain it to him. He wasn't really understanding it. So I left and uh, I went to a couple other places and nobody had anything. And so mm-hmm. I was driving back to my house and I said to myself, this is really. One, this is really weird. This doesn't. I'm exist. surprised, actually, because you'd think that's the reason. One of the reasons I think people talk about it is it's natural. You know, it comes from the ground. So I'm surprised that the edibles wouldn't have the same almost philosophy behind it. Right. That's exactly was my. That was exactly my thought. And when you begin to understand that the cannabis plant is perhaps the most beneficial plant to humanity. In terms of it has so many uses and it's like it's so wonderful and cures cancer and you can make hemp and rope and canvas and all this crap <laughs> that it's so good. Uh, I'm like, how can no one have like put this in a good thing for you? You know what right. I mean? Like I'm eating the cannabis, which is good for me, but it's in sugar that is like gonna kill me. So <laughs> I was like, okay, that's good. That there's a, there's an opportunity there. Right. And then I said to myself, well. Then my entrepreneur mode kicks in now, and I've started a couple companies at this point. And I'm like, well, well, why don't I start a company and do 
this healthy snack. And then I said, well, what do I know about it? You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to get into the weed business. It's illegal. And like, I'm crazy. And then like, you know, I'm having this conversation in my head. And then this other part of me says, well, actually, Joe, you are a world domain expert in snack food, right? Your business has interacted with probably over 200 snack brands. We have, we have a library of snacks of all the packages from all, you know, all different brands all over the world, all over, Mm. you know, I get this huge compendium of it. I know all the rules. I know the players. I know the package makers. And while we had never actually made any food ourselves, we'd only been a third party. I said, "Well, it's not so crazy, actually. Actually, I know a lot about it. I mean, I'm not. You know, I don't know what you could be good at different things in, in that in the Venn diagram of what you need. You know. But I was like, oh, wow. You so have I'm some actually, domain expertise. I do have some domain expertise. I'm not a total novice about it. Um, I know what makes a good snack, and I know how to sell it. You know, which is one of the main things. Right. And I had also just coincidentally or not a coincidence, like 10 years ago when I was living in Florida and I was just getting into the health food idea, I had experimented and made my own healthy edibles, uh, you know, like 10 years ago that I made like in a sum- one summer, I kind of got into it. And, I, and I'm very, a very very detail oriented person and I, and I had everything stored in Evernote. And I was like, man, I wonder if that like recipe is still there. Wow. And I went back to my house that day and the recipe was there. And I was like – so I went onto Amazon and I overnighted like 20, 30 different things that I thought I needed. It was, so I had – I went to this dispensary on like – you know, I had like the yoga class on a Wednesday. I went to the, to the dispensary on a Thursday and that night I overnighted everything and all the stuff arrived on Friday – and I had my partner Shannon. And I said, "Look, you're working on this with me all weekend." And I went it's to Whole Foods. Startup weekend up. all over again, right? And we did startup weekend. And by the end of the weekend, I had like 20 of these jumbo. We called them jumbo bars at the time. Right. We don't make bars, ironically, anymore. But they were they were like kind of like a bar, you know, kind of shape. What is it closest to? Is it? I saw that they, there's CBD cookie dough truffle. There's relaxed yes. truffle. What was it? Now, the cookie dough truffle is was a bar. And now we've we've improved it, and it's now like in that current incarnation. Yeah. But it started off as like a bar, and we had a it's totally packaged, and we had a, you know, we had a label, and it was sealed. And I mean, I had a pro thing. It was one of the fastest turnarounds from idea to execution mm. I've ever done. Was that like on a Thursday I ordered the stuff, and then Sunday we had a product. Wow. And on Monday morning I drove to the biggest and best dispensary that I I knew of in Los Angeles. And when I got there, uh, uh, Whoopi Goldberg was like walking out of it. Hope I didn't out her as a weed smoker. And, uh, <laughs> was, I knew it was like a good place. She could have been asking about a friend. No. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I walked in, and I said, "Hey, who's you know who's in charge?" And they're like, "Oh, I'm here." And I said, "Hey, can I talk to you? I got a product. You're gonna love it." And I sold this lady, uh, like a, a case of you know Jumbo bars. And it wasn't like a huge sale. It was like one kind of case of it. But I walked out of there and I was like, okay, like I got something. I just did it. You know what I mean? Like, like, right. Because normally sales, even if you're really good, like you fail, you know, seven out of 10 times. Right, right. But I, I, I was fortunate that it wasn't just that I'm so good, but I mean, I got lucky and I closed this lady on the first one I walked into at one of like the most prestigious places. And I was like, okay, like this could work. And then they were, we were off to the races. You know, that's truly amazing, Joe. And uh, I have so many questions, but I know um, you probably want to meditate or something right now after this interview. <laughs> so, you know, I guess, you know, for Jumbo Superfoods, um, yeah. anything, any other milestones you want to talk about? With Jumbo Superfoods, I just have a few, like a couple more questions in general, um, because I have to hold myself back because I do have could go for another two hours. Um, but we'll we'll do another one. Yeah, later. yeah. So Jumbo Superfoods, sure. W- what's important from there? So from that first sale and that first product, and now you have I don't know how many products, like ten, nine products or something. Right now, well, we got we've got in terms of SKUs, yeah. there's probably almost 30 SKUs, mm-hmm. and we're launching another 30 yeah. in Q, Q1 of this year. Yeah. So it's a lot. Yeah. So I guess 
maybe nine product lines, but then they come in different you know sizes and stuff like that. Yeah. So what else do you want to say about the Jamba Superfoods? Like maybe it's a challenge or maybe it's uh, a milestone that you hit. Um, okay. Well, I'd say I'd say the challenges are um, like now that I've started a couple a few businesses and I kind of like got the formula down a little bit. Um, what anytime you start a business, it's tough. But what has been really tough about the cannabis space is that there's no no one's done it before. There's no mentors. There's no leaders. There's really no one you can call and yeah. say like, how do we do this? And then you also have all these contradicting rules, which are like, you know, making it even more confusing. So it's like super confusing. There's no one you can reach out to. You don't have access to capital. You don't have access to banking. You don't have access to the post office. You don't have that. You know, you can't access anything out of the state. Right. So there's all these extra problems. Your hands get tied on a number of arenas that make it even harder to do business. Right. It's like so. Normally, it's like if you re- if you start a business, it's like okay, you got to run up the mountain twenty miles, like, and like very few people can do that. And if you do, you, you make it through. Well, in the cannabis case, they're like, all right, you're gonna run up the mountain, but before you get started, like, let's just shackle like <laughs> hundred pounds and weights on your, your ankles. Right. Right. So like that's kind of the. It's been right. even that much harder, which I kind of feel like for my next business. It's going to be like if you're, you've been swimming in a pool and then with a weight vest off and then you take on and you take it off and it's like, wow, it's so easy. Right. It's going to seem easier because I got all these challenges. So right. I would say that has been um, one of the, you know, the kind of like the challenge of it. Uh, and then I would say in terms of, of takeaways and kind of highlights, um, uh, I've gotten, I, I got to meet Joe Rogan and, um, just because he's a huge fan of the product, and the, and the world kind of just brought us together. Hmm. And uh, have you been on the Joe Rogan podcast before? Not yet. Um, that's a, that's in the making for sure. Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it is. And that was just kind of. We'll just cool send him the beginning clip of this, and he'll have you on. <laughs> Our well, initial initial twenty minute conversation. Oh yeah, psych- we didn't even get into the psych- psychedelic uh, uh, orgasmic meditation or any of the other like really risque uh, topics, um, and the shamanizing and the yoga and all that stuff. But so just getting to meet him, not mm. that that was like oh my god, I met my hero, but the way it happened, where it was just like it just kind of happened in this organic, unforced way that I wasn't expecting it, and then boom, like this really. This guy that I, you know, I've listened to him talk for like a thousand hours in right. all the shows. Yeah, so that was kind of cool that that happened, and that he is such a fan of the product, just totally organically, unsolicited, unpaid. So to see the kind of that thing kind of come through was real cool. Yeah, and then another one was uh, when we closed on our funding. Um, I never put a tie on in the whole fundraising process. That was about like <laughs> 10, 10 months, and. Um, that was like kind of an eternal goal that I started. Is I was like, you know, I got a suit you that I really like. You want to be who you are. Yeah, I didn't want to force myself into some box. Um, my parents, you know, when we would we'd meet with investors and we I, I, we couldn't get them to, to come on board because it's a very challenging investment with all the rules and the laws and everything. Right. You know, my dad was like, well, maybe if you know if you put a suit on and a tie, you know, like maybe that's what it is. And I was like, or it's the fact that I'm dealing with, you know, all these other challenges and laws and all this stuff. Uh, but so when that all went through, that was kind of cool that I, I was able to, you know, be my authentic self and be my crazy. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I showed up to when I went to, to meet with investors. Um, you know, I didn't put on this fake persona and suit and, you know, shave my head and become this clean cut guy that, you know, everyone says like, that's the person you need to be. I showed up and I said, look, I'm this crazy psychedelic shaman, business lover, inventor person and that's what makes – you know, that's where all the inspiration comes from and that's what it is. And I I felt that there was people out there that would resonate with that and our mission and what we're trying to do and, you know, bring quality to people, make super high quality products, not just – you know, we're going to make money. Of course, that's important in anything you do um, but that's not the only thing. And uh, so that was that was another challenging piece of it. But when that all came yeah. through and it worked because I was my true self, that was a, a nice validation, validating moment. Yeah. yeah. Joe's awesome. Joe's so I have awesome. two last questions, if you have the time. If you like, Jeremy, shut up. I got to go to sleep. That would be cool too. No, no, no. Okay. I'm, I'm good. Okay. I might have to pee a little bit, but you got two more. <laughs> oh. All right. So I want to just 
plug the sponsor for a second because they're they're super helpful. I actually use them. Um, you know, I'm always thinking about automation, just like you were with the four hour work week and how I could do more in less time. And that's one of the reasons I use and you know have Scubana as a sponsor because they help me automate my inventory management without multiple fragmented spreadsheets. I can automatically send out inventory to any customer from any platform. I can automate my purchase orders when they hit a certain level. And they also tell me what SKUs are profitable so I can get that report. But what I actually like the most is the founder of it is also a big e-commerce seller. So if something breaks, I know, not that it has broken, but I know that he's going to fix it because he eats his own dog food and he uses it. So people should check out Skubana uh, for their e-commerce software needs. Um, so, Joe, my last two questions are one, I want to hear about the low point, the lowest point so far, because you've had three businesses, a lot of journey, and then the proudest moment. Um, so what's been the lowest point for you? I'm, I'm going to have to apologize. Uh, you, you got very garbled, mm. and I, I didn't hear, um, I really didn't hear what the question was. Oh, you the, the lowest point, and, and then about the proudest moment. But start with the lowest point. Um, the lowest point. Well, I think we touched on it earlier. I, I mean, just when when cash flow was getting was getting low, and um, I was kind of running out of money, and we were losing customers. Um, you know, that's like a conventional kind of like storyline. Okay, you know, that's the low point. Yeah. Um, at the time, I mean, it doesn't necessarily feel good when you're you know, having to kind of go through that. But I, I was able to keep the perspective that – and the narrative I told myself was like, okay, you got these great ideas. You're working really hard. This is going to work and you're going to be a success. Yeah. And like once that happens, like you're probably going to be a success like maybe forever, hopefully. You know, like yeah. once you get up there, like, you know, Donald Trump isn't – not. oh my God, I don't want to you know if I should compare myself to him. But he's not going to be <laughs> – He's not going to be running out of money, even if one of his businesses goes bankrupt. You know what I'm saying? He's going to ha- kind of like transcend that, yeah. that, that piece. Yeah. So I tried to look at that time as like, okay, this is my time like when I'm almost out of money and I have to like grovel at my vendors and I have to like go through this. And this was like the gym. It was like, it was like kind of that part of it, building that character as an entrepreneur and having yeah. that experience was like getting that plugged into me yeah. to like, okay, you got to get the scarcity experience. You can't just yeah. have all abundance because right. then you're going to be a spoiled bitch. So we're going to take all your money away. <laughs> you got to like all these difficult conversations and like cut everybody's salaries. And now if, you know, I have an employee that comes to me and says, oh, look, you know, my student loans, I, I, I need to, you know, be paid more, I, whatever. I can say, well, look, I know what it's like to be out of money. So I, you know what I mean? I can talk at that level. Right. So it's that your was like a low your old badge, badge of honor type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. That kind of, I, I think it's, a, for me, it was important to have that experience. So that was kind of like, like a low point. Um, and then, uh, I'd say that I'd say the high point, not that it's like, I can crystallize it into one specific like moment that I could describe, but, but I, I remember, being in the office one day recently and just kind of like looking around and I, there was just so many people like happily buzzing around and making things and, you know, making phone calls and selling and coming in and it just was like, it's working, you know, like it's all just like just flowing, like as the opposite of what the experience I just described where it was like, holy shit, like how am I even going to, you know, I don't. I don't want to answer the phone because it's going to be some vendor like telling yeah. me I owe the money. Yeah. To then be like, okay, wow, like it's all going to work out. It's it, happily ever after. Like we're in that moment of, you know, it's flowing, um, and and just kind of like letting that experience be a visceral experiential experience versus knowing it and just kind of like being in that uh, in that moment. I just I go back to that space, um, and that's really been the best. Yeah. Joe, this has been absolutely fantastic, and uh, I just thank you so much for spending the time and energy and your your wisdom uh, with us. So hopefully we'll do it again. Great. Hopefully we'll see you on many uh, Joe Rogan at some point and, and uh, much more. And I'm coming back to finish the rest of your questions. There's... 
I will have many more questions for you. If you're up for it, I'm up for it. So yeah, we'll do the uh, we'll do the uh, the more esoteric, uh, you know, more 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 risky version. Yeah, like the, I, the, yeah, the more risky <laughs> version is cool. And you know, it's just there's so many questions. Even the LinkedIn profile, I could have talked for an hour about. You know, because you describe yourself as entrepreneur, inventor, yogi, mystic. You know, each one of yeah. those. You know, the mystic part is probably. Like a whole, what does mystic mean? To you? I don't know. That I was going to ask why you put mystic. Um, I mean, mystic to me. Obviously, I saw that that visual of you with the skulls, um, and I, I was and I read a little bit about. Uh, someone posted, "Are you with the shaman or something?" So I picture like um, just spiritual using crystals or the universe. I'm not. You know, that's what I visualize. Nothing concrete. Okay. Yeah. Uh, should I go into? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, okay. Well, so so mystic to me yeah. means that it's someone like okay, uh, the shaman that I ref my shaman down in Peru. Put it this way, he, I'm like you know what is what is shamanism, and he's like well, in religion, you basically have these people. That say they can talk to God. So like the Pope is like God's person here or whatever. Yeah. And then the priests like are able to like you know, so they liaise between you and Carry God or this intermediary thing. Yeah. Whereas a shaman is someone that would say, instead of like saying like God t- says you should do this, the shaman will say, Well, if you want to know what God says, why don't you go ask him? I'll help you get there. Mm. So they try to just take you directly to the source wow. versus like wow. being this intermediary person in between and to me that is the role of the mystic it's the person that goes direct to the divine Mm. and Mm. seeks out the wisdom directly and uh there's a bunch of different technologies that exist to allow people to have these mystical experiences whether they're uh, isolation tanks certain breathing or pranayams or psychedelic medicines and drugs so there's different ways to activate kind of the mystical experience um and I, I'm a fan of doing that. That's a great way of describing it. Yeah. So when will be your next mystic journey? Uh, I mean, I, I meditate daily. So, I mean, there's, there's different levels of, of that commuting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, like, for example, yoga uh, translates into union. Yeah. And to me, like the true definition of yoga, what people think of it as in America – uh, you know, warrior one stretching, and it is those things. But right. really, it's union, and it's the union of the individual self with the universal self. So, so yeah. the so one be- becoming one with God, yeah. that meeting yeah. of the two. Um, yeah. And so that's to me what my yoga practice is. It, it's yeah. it's working yeah. at dissolving the, my ego, my identity, and commuting with with everything. Um, so you can do that with. A meditation and just trying to release from the thoughts and the and the observer that is you. Yeah. Uh, but then you can also do you know, very powerful psychedelic medicines that really ensure that's going to happen at a massive scale for a long time. Um, so I try to do those on a heartbeat. Um, hmm. You know, the funny thing about these drugs is is they say you're you're going to become a drug addict when you do these really powerful medicines like. You're not racing to go back and do them again. I mean, it, they're very intense, and usually you need a lot of time to kind of process them and understand the the enormity of the experience. So, um, you know, probably in the summer we'll we'll do another deep You're dive. Like next week? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> very well, good. Cool. This was really fun, Joe, and awesome. you've got a great way of drawing you know people out. And uh, thank you so much for having me Thanks, on the show. Thanks, Joe. I really appreciate it.